Fireside Christmas Short Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fireside Christmas Short Stories by Various. Christmas at Red Butte by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Of course Santa Claus will come said jimmy martin confidently jimmy was ten and at ten it is easy to be confident why he's got to come because it is christmas eve and he always has to come you know that twins yes the twins knew it and cheered by jimmy's superior wisdom their doubts passed away there had been one terrible moment when theodora had sighed and told them they mustn't be too much disappointed if santa claus did not come this year because the crops had been poor and he mightn't have had enough presents to go around that doesn't make any difference to santa claus scoffed jimmy you know as well as i do theodora prentice that santa claus is rich whether the crops fail or not they failed three years ago before father died but santa claus came all the same probably you don't remember it twins cause you were too little but i do of course he'll come so don't you worry a mite and he'll bring my skates and your dolls he knows we're expecting them theodora cause we wrote him a letter last week and threw it up the chimney and there'll be candy and nuts of course and mother's gone to town to buy a turkey i tell you we're going to have a ripping christmas we don't use such slangy words about it jimmy boy sighed theodora she couldn't bear to dampen their hopes any further and perhaps Aunt Elizabeth might manage if the colt sold well. But Theodora had her painful doubts, and she sighed again as she looked out of the window far down the trail that wound across the prairie, red-lighted by the declining sun of the short wintry afternoon. Do people always sigh like that when they get to be sixteen? asked Jimmy curiously. You didn't sigh like that when you were only fifteen, Theodora. I wish you wouldn't it makes me feel funny and it's not a nice kind of funniness either It's a bad habit. I've got into lately said Theodora trying to laugh old folks are dull sometimes you know Jimmy boy Sixteen is awful old isn't it said Jimmy reflectively I'll tell you what I'm going to do when I'm sixteen Theodora I'm going to pay off the mortgage and buy mother a silk dress and a piano for the twins won't that be elegant i'll be able to do that cause i'm a man of course if i was only a girl i couldn't i hope you'll be a good kind brave man and a real help to your mother said theodora softly sitting down before the cosy fire and lifting the fat little twins into her lap oh i'll be good to her never you fear assured jimmy squatting comfortably down on the little fur rug before the stove the skin of a coyote his father had killed four years ago i believe in being good to your mother when you've got only the one now tell us a story theodora a real jolly story you know with lots of fighting in it only please don't kill anybody i like to hear about fighting but i like to have all the people come out alive theodora laughed and began a story about the real rebellion of eighty five a story which had the double merit of being true and exciting at the same time it was quite dark when she finished and the twins were nodding but jimmy's eyes were wide open and sparkling that was great he said drawing a long breath tell us another no it's bedtime for you all said theodora firmly one story at a time is my rule you know but i want to sit up till mother comes home objected jimmy you can't she may be very late for she said she would have to wait to see mr porter besides you don't know what time santa claus might come if he comes at all if he were to drive along and see you children up instead of being sound asleep in bed he might go right on and never call at all this argument was too much for jimmy all right we'll go but we have to hang up our stockings first twins get yours the twins toddled off in great excitement and brought back their sunday stockings which jimmy proceeded to hang along the edge of the mantel shelf this done 
they all trooped obediently off to bed theodora gave another sigh and seated herself at the window where she could watch the moonlit prairie for mrs martin's homecoming and knit at the same time i am afraid that you will think from all the sighing theodora was doing that she was a very melancholy and despondent young lady you couldn't think anything more unlike the real theodora she was the jolliest bravest girl of sixteen in all saskatchewan as her shining brown eyes and rosy dimpled cheeks would have told you and her sighs were not on her own account but simply for fear the children were going to be disappointed she knew that they would be almost heartbroken if santa claus did not come and that this would hurt the patient hard-working little mother more than all else five years before this theodora had come to live with uncle george and aunt elizabeth in the little log house at red butte her own mother had just died and theodora had only her big brother donald left and donald had klondike fever the martins were poor but they had gladly made room for their little niece and theodora had lived there ever since her aunt's right-hand girl and the beloved playmate of the children they had been very happy until uncle george's death two years before this christmas eve but since then there had been hard times in the little log house and though mrs martin and theodora did their best it was a woefully hard task to make both ends meet especially this year when the crops had been poor theodora and her aunt had made every sacrifice possible for the children's sake and at least jimmy and the twins had not felt the pinch very severely yet at seven mrs martin's bells jingled at the door and theodora flew out go right in and get warm auntie she said briskly i'll take ned away and unharness him it's a bitterly cold night said mrs martin wearily there was a note of discouragement in her voice that struck dismay to theodora's heart i'm afraid it means no christmas for the children tomorrow she thought sadly as she led ned away to the stable when she returned to the kitchen mrs martin was sitting by the fire her face in her chilled hand sobbing convulsively auntie oh auntie don't exclaimed theodora impulsively it was such a rare thing to see her plucky resolute little aunt in tears you're cold and tired i'll have a nice cup of tea for you in a trice no it isn't that said mrs martin brokenly it was seeing those stockings hanging there theodora i couldn't get a thing for the children not a single thing mr porter would only give forty dollars for the colt and when all the bills were paid there was barely enough left for such necessaries as we must have i suppose i ought to feel thankful i could get those but the thought of the children's disappointment tomorrow is more than i can bear it would have been better to have told them long ago but i kept building on getting more for the colt well it's weak and foolish to give way like this we'd better both take a cup of tea and go to bed it will save fuel when theodora went up to her little room her face was very thoughtful she took a small box from her table and carried it to the window in it was a very pretty little gold locket hung on a narrow blue ribbon theodora held it tenderly in her fingers and looked out over the moonlit prairie with a very sober face could she give up her dear locket the locket donald had given her just before he started for the klondike she had never thought she could do such a thing it was almost the only thing she had to remind her of donald handsome merry impulsive warm-hearted donald who had gone away four years ago with a smile on his bonny face and splendid hope in his heart here's a locket for you gift o god he had said gaily he had such a dear loving habit of calling her by the beautiful meaning of her name a lump came into theodora's throat as she remembered it i couldn't afford a chain too but when i come back i'll bring you a rope of klondike nuggets for it then he had gone away for two years letters had come from him regularly then he wrote that he had joined a prospecting party to a remote wilderness after that was silence deepening into anguish of suspense that finally ended in hopelessness a rumor came that donald prentice was dead 
none had returned from the expedition he had joined theodora had long ago given up all hope of ever seeing donald again hence her locket was doubly dear to her but aunt elizabeth had always been so good and loving and kind to her could she not make the sacrifice for her sake yes she could and would theodora flung up her head with a gesture that meant decision she took out of the locket the bits of hair her mother's and donald's which it contained perhaps a tear or two fell as she did so and then hastily donned her warmest cap and wraps it was only three miles to spencer she could easily walk it in an hour and as it was christmas eve the shops would be open late she must walk for ned could not be taken out again and the mare's foot was sore besides aunt elizabeth must not know until it was done as stealthily as if she were bound on some nefarious errand theodora slipped downstairs and out of the house the next minute she was hurrying along the trail in the moonlight the great dazzling prairie was around her the mystery and splendor of the northern night all about her it was very calm and cold but theodora walked so briskly that she kept warm the trail from red butte to spencer was a lonely one mr lurgan's house halfway to town was the only dwelling on it when theodora reached spencer she made her way at once to the only jewelry store the little town contained mr benson its owner had been a friend of her uncle's and theodora felt sure that he would buy her locket nevertheless her heart beat quickly and her breath came and went uncomfortably fast as she went in suppose he wouldn't buy it then there would be no christmas for the children at red butte good evening miss theodora said mr benson briskly what can i do for you i'm afraid i'm not a very welcome sort of customer mr benson said theodora with an uncertain smile i want to sell not buy could you will you buy this locket mr benson pursed up his lips took up the locket and examined it well i don't often buy second-hand stuff he said after some reflection but i don't mind obliging you miss theodora i'll give you four dollars for this trinket theodora knew the locket had cost a great deal more than that but four dollars would get what she wanted and she dared not ask for more in a few minutes the locket was in mr benson's possession and theodora with four crisp new bills in her purse was hurrying to the toy store half an hour later she was on her way back to red butte with as many parcels as she could carry jimmy's skates two lovely dolls for the twins packages of nuts and candy and a nice plump turkey theodora beguiled her lonely tramp by picturing the children's joy in the morning about a quarter of a mile past Mr. Lurgan's house, the trail curved suddenly about a bluff of poplars. As Theodora rounded the turn, she halted in amazement. Almost at her feet, the body of a man was lying across the road. He was clad in a big fur coat, and had a fur cap pulled well down over his forehead and ears. Almost all of him that could be seen was a full, bushy beard. Theodora had no idea who he was or where he had come from But she realized that he was unconscious and that he would speedily freeze to death if help were not brought The footprints of a horse galloping across the prairie suggested a fall and a runaway But Theodora did not waste time in speculation She ran back at full speed to mr. Lurgan's and roused the household in a few minutes mr. Lurgan and his son had hitched a horse to a wood sleigh and hurried down the trail to the unfortunate man theodora knowing that her assistance was not needed and that she ought to get home as quickly as possible went on her way as soon as she had seen the stranger in safe keeping when she reached the little log house she crept in cautiously put the children's gifts in their stockings placed the turkey on the table where aunt elizabeth would see it first thing in the morning and then slipped off to bed a very weary but very happy girl the joy that reigned in the little log house the next day more than repaid theodora for her sacrifice whoopee didn't i tell you that santa claus would come all right shouted the delighted jimmy 
Oh, what splendid skates! The twins hugged their dolls in silent rapture, but Aunt Elizabeth's face was the best of all. Then the dinner had to be prepared, and everybody had a hand in that. Just as Theodora, after a grave peep into the oven, had announced that the turkey was done, a sleigh dashed around the house. Theodora flew to answer the knock at the door, and there stood Mr. Lurgan, and a big, bewhiskered, fur-coated fellow, whom Theodora recognized as a stranger she had found on the trail. But was he a stranger? There was something oddly familiar in those merry brown eyes. Theodora felt herself growing dizzy. Donald! she gasped. Oh, Donald! And then she was in the big fellow's arms, laughing and crying at the same time. Donald it was indeed, and then followed half an hour, during which everybody talked at once, and the turkey would have been burned to a crisp had it not been for the presence of mind of Mr. Lurgan, who, being the least excited of them all, took it out of the oven and set it on the back of the stove. "'To think that it was you last night, and that I never dreamed it!' exclaimed Theodora. "'Oh, Donald, if I hadn't gone to town!' "'I'd have frozen to death, I'm afraid,' said Donald soberly. I got into Spencer on the last train last night. I felt that I must come right out. I couldn't wait till morning, but there wasn't a team to be got for love or money. It was Christmas Eve, and all the livery rigs were out. So I came on horseback. Just by that bluff something frightened my horse, and he shied violently. I was half asleep and thinking of my little sister, and I went off like a shot. I suppose I struck my head against a tree, Anyway, I knew nothing more until I came to in Mr. Lurgan's kitchen. I wasn't much hurt, feel none the worse of it, except for a sore head and shoulder. But, oh, gift of God, how you have grown! I can't realize that you are the little sister I left four years ago. I suppose you have been thinking I was dead. Yes, and, oh, Donald, where have you been? Well, I went way up north with a prospecting party. We had a tough time the first year, I can tell you, and some of us never came back. We weren't in a country where post offices were lying around loose either, you see. Then, at last, just as we were about giving up in despair, we struck it rich. I brought a snug little pile home with me, and things are going to look up in this log house, gift of God. There'll be no more worrying for you dear people over mortgages. I'm so glad, for auntie's sake said theodora with shining eyes but oh donald it's best of all just to have you back i'm so perfectly happy that i don't know what to do or say well i think you might have dinner said jimmy in an injured tone the turkey's getting stone cold and i'm most starving i just can't stand it another minute so with a laugh they all sat down to the table and ate the merriest christmas dinner the little log house had ever known. End of Christmas at Red Butte by Lucy Maud Montgomery Fireside Christmas Short Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fireside Christmas Short Stories by Various The Heavenly Christmas Tree by Fyodor Dostoevsky. I am a novelist, and I suppose I have made up this story. I write, I suppose, though I know for a fact that I have made it up, but yet I keep fancying that it must have happened somewhere at some time, that it must have happened on Christmas Eve in some great town in a time of terrible frost. I have a vision of a boy, a little boy, six years old or even younger, this boy woke up that morning in a cold, damp cellar. He was dressed in a sort of little dressing gown, and was shivering with cold. There was a cloud of white steam from his breath, and sitting on a box in the corner, he blew the steam out of his mouth and amused himself in his dullness watching it float away. But he was terribly hungry. Several times that morning he went up to the plank bed where his sick mother was lying on a mattress as thin as a pancake with some sort of bundle under her head for a pillow. How had she come here? She must have come with her boy from some other town and suddenly fallen ill. 
The landlady who let the corners had been taken two days before to the police station. The lodgers were out and about as the holiday was so near, and the only one left had been lying for the last twenty-four hours dead drunk, not having waited for Christmas. In another corner of the room, a wretched old woman of eighty, who had once been a children's nurse, but was now left to die friendless, was moaning and groaning with rheumatism, scolding and grumbling at the boy so that he was afraid to go near her corner. He got a drink of water in the outer room, but could not find a crust anywhere, and had been on the point of waking his mother a dozen times. He felt frightened at last in the darkness. It had long been dusk, but no light was kindled. Touching his mother's face, he was surprised that she did not move at all, and that she was cold as the wall. It is very cold here, he thought. He stood a little, unconsciously letting his hand rest on the dead woman's shoulders. Then he breathed on his fingers to warm them, and then quietly fumbling for his cap on the bed, he went out the cellar. He would have gone earlier, but was afraid of the big dog which had been howling all day at the neighbour's door at the top of the stairs. But the dog was not there now, and he went out onto the street. Mercy on us, what a town! He had never seen anything like it before. In the town from which he had come, it was always such black darkness at night. There was one lamp for the whole street. The little, low-pitched wooden houses were closed up with shutters. There was no one to be seen in the street after dusk. All the people shut themselves up in their houses, and there was nothing but howling packs of dogs, hundreds of thousands of them barking and howling all night. But there it was so warm and he was giving food while well, here, oh dear, if he only had something to eat. And what a noise and rattle here, what light and what people, horses and carriages, and what a frost. The frozen steam hung in clouds over the horses, over their warmly breathing mouths, their hoofs clanged against the stones through the powdery snow, and everyone pushed so, and oh dear, how he longed for some morsel to eat, and how wretched he suddenly felt. A policeman walked by and he turned away to avoid seeing the boy. Here was another street, oh, what a wide one, where he could run over for certain, how everyone was shouting, racing and driving along, and the light, the light, and what was this, a huge glass window, and through the window, a tree reaching up to the ceiling, it was a fir tree, and on it were ever so many lights, gold papers and apples and little dolls and horses, and there were children clean and dressed in their best running about the room, laughing and playing and eating and drinking something. And then a little girl began to dance with one of the boys. What a pretty little girl! And he could hear music through the window. The boy looked and wondered and laughed, though his toes were aching with the cold and his fingers were red and stiff so that it hurt him to move them. And all at once the boy remembered how his toes and fingers hurt him, and began crying, and ran on, and again through another window pane he saw another Christmas tree, and on a table cakes of all sorts almond cakes, red cakes, and yellow cakes, and three grand young ladies were sitting there, and they gave the cakes to anyone who went up to them, and the door kept opening, lots of gentlemen and ladies went in from the street. The boy crept up, suddenly opened the door and went in. Oh, how they shouted at him and waved him back. One lady went up to him hurriedly and slipped a kopeck in his hand, and with her own hands opened the door into the street for him. How frightened he was, and the kopeck rolled away and clinked upon the steps. He could not bend his red fingers to hold it tight. The boy ran away and went on, where, he did not know. He was ready to cry again, but he was afraid, and ran on and on and blew his fingers. And he was miserable, because he felt suddenly so alone and terrified, when all at once, mercy on us. What was this again? People were standing in the crowd admiring. Behind a glass window there were three little dolls, dressed in red and green dresses, and exactly, exactly as though they were alive. One was a little old man sitting and playing a big violin. The two others were standing close by and playing little violins and nodding in time, and looking at one another, and their lips moved. They were speaking, actually speaking, only one you couldn't hear through the glass. And at first the boy thought they were alive, and when he grasped that they were dolls he laughed. He had never seen such dolls before, and he had no idea there were such dolls. And he wanted to cry, but he felt amused, amused by the dolls. And all at once he fancied that someone had caught his smock behind, a wicked big boy that was standing beside him and suddenly hit him on the head, snatched off his cap and tripped him up. The boy fell down on the ground. At once there was a shout. He was numb with fright. He jumped up and ran away. He ran, and not knowing where he was going, 
ran in the gate of someone's courtyard and sat down behind a stack of wood. They won't find me here, besides it's dark. He sat huddled up and was breathless from fright, and all at once, quite suddenly, he felt so happy. His hands and feet, suddenly left off aching, grew so warm, as warm as though he were on a stove, then he shivered all over, then gave a start, why, he must have been asleep. How nice to have a sleep here. I'll sit here a little and go and look at the dolls again, said the boy, and smiled, thinking of them, just as though they were alive. And suddenly he heard his mother singing over him. Mammy, I am asleep. How nice it is to sleep here. Come to my Christmas tree, little one, a soft voice whispered over his head. He thought that this was still his mother, but no, it was not she. Who it was calling him, he could not see, but someone bent over and embraced him in the darkness, and he stretched out his hands to him, and, all at once, oh, what a bright light! Oh, what a Christmas tree! And yet it was not a fir tree. He had never seen a tree like that. Where was he now? Everything was bright and shining, and all around him were dolls. But no, they were not dolls. They were little girls and boys, only so bright and shining. They all came flying around him. They all kissed him and took him and carried him along with them, and he was flying himself. And he saw that his mother was looking at him and laughing joyfully. Mammy, Mammy, oh, how nice it is here, Mammy. And he kissed the children and wanted to tell them at once of those dolls in the shop window. Who are you, boys? Who are you, girls? he asked laughing and admiring them. This is Christ's Christmas tree, they answered. Christ always has a Christmas tree on this day, for the little children who have no tree on their own. And he found out that all these little boys and girls were children just like himself, that some had been frozen in the baskets in which they had as babies been laid on the doorstep of well-to-do Petersburg people. Others had been boarded out with Finnish women by the foundling and had been suffocated. Others had died at their starved mother's breasts. Others had died in the third-class railway carriages from the foul air, and yet they were all here. They were all like angels about Christ, and he was in the midst of them, and he held out his hands to them and blessed them and their sinful mothers. As the mothers of these children stood on one side weeping, each one knew her boy or girl, and the children flew up to them and kissed them, and wiped away their tears with their little hands, and begged them not to weep because they were so happy. And down below in the morning, Porter found the dead little boy of a frozen child on the woodstack. They sought out his mother too. She had died before him. They met before the Lord God in heaven. Why have I made up such a story, so out of keeping with an ordinary diary, and a writer's above it all? And I promised two stories dealing with real events. But that is just it. I keep fancying that all this may have happened really. That is, what took place in the cellar and on the woodstack. But as for Christ's Christmas tree... I cannot tell you whether that could have happened or not. End of The Heavenly Christmas Tree by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Fireside Christmas Short Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fireside Christmas Short Stories by Various the Gift of the Magi by O. Henry Recording by Deborah Lee One dollar and eighty-seven cents. That was all. And sixty cents of it was in pennies. Pennies saved one and two at a time by bulldozing the grocer and the vegetable man and the butcher until one's cheeks burned with the silent imputation of parsimony that such close dealing implied. Three times Della counted it. One dollar and eighty-seven cents. And the next day would be Christmas. There was clearly nothing to do but flop down on the shabby little couch and howl. So Della did it. Which instigates the moral reflection that life is made up of sobs, sniffles, and smiles, with sniffles predominating. While the mistress of the home is gradually subsiding from the first stage to the second, take a look at the home. A furnished flat at eight dollars per week. It did not exactly beggar description, but it certainly had that word on the lookout for the mendicancy squad. In the vestibule below was a letter box into which no letter would go, and an electric button from which no mortal finger could coax a ring. Also appertaining thereunto was a card bearing the name Mr. James Dillingham Young. The Dillingham had been flung to the breeze during a former period of prosperity when its possessor was being paid thirty dollars per week. Now, 
When the income was shrunk to twenty dollars, though, they were thinking seriously of contracting to a modest and unassuming D. But whenever Mr. James Dillingham Young came home and reached his flat above, he was called Jim, and greatly hugged by Mrs. James Dillingham Young, already introduced to you as Della, which is all very good. Della finished her cry and attended to her cheeks with the powder rag. She stood by the window and looked out dully at a gray cat walking a gray fence in a gray backyard. Tomorrow would be Christmas Day, and she had only one dollar and eighty-seven cents with which to buy Jim a present. She had been saving every penny she could for months with this result. Twenty dollars a week doesn't go far. Expenses had been greater than she had calculated. They always are. Only one dollar eighty-seven cents to buy a present for Jim. Her Jim. Many a happy hour she had spent planning for something nice for him. Something fine and rare and sterling. Something just a little bit near to being worthy of the honor of being owned by Jim. There was a pier glass between the windows of the room. Perhaps you have seen a pier glass in an eight-dollar flat. A very thin and very agile person may, by observing his reflection in a rapid sequence of longitudinal strips, obtain a fairly accurate conception of his looks. Della, being slender, had mastered the art. Suddenly she whirled from the window and stood before the glass. Her eyes were shining brightly, but her face had lost its color within twenty seconds. Rapidly she pulled down her hair and let it fall to its full length. Now, there were two possessions of the James Dillingham Youngs, in which they both took a mighty pride. One was Jim's gold watch that had been his father's and his grandfather's. The other was Della's hair. Had the Queen of Sheba lived in the flat across the air shaft, Della would have let her hair hang out the window some day to dry, just to depreciate Her Majesty's jewels and gifts. Had King Solomon been the janitor, with all his treasures piled up in the basement, Jim would have pulled out his watch every time he passed, just to see him pluck at his beard from envy. So now Della's beautiful hair fell about her rippling and shining like a cascade of brown waters. It reached below her knee and made itself almost a garment for her. And then she did it up again, nervously and quickly. Once she faltered for a minute and stood still while a tear or two splashed on the worn red carpet, on went her old brown jacket, on went her old brown hat. With a whirl of skirts and with the brilliant sparkle still in her eyes, she fluttered out the door and down the stairs to the street. Where she stopped, the sign read, Madame Sophronie, hair goods of all kinds. One flight up, Della ran, and collected herself, panting. Madame, large, too white, chilly, hardly looked the Sophronie. "'Will you buy my hair?' asked Della. "'I buy hair,' said Madame. "'Take your hat off and let's have a sight at the looks of it.' Down rippled the brown cascade. Twenty dollars,' said Madame, lifting the mass with a practiced hand. "'Give it to me quick,' said Della. "'Oh, and the next two hours tripped by on rosy wings.' Forget the hashed metaphor. She was ransacking the stores for Jim's present.' She found it at last. It surely had been made for Jim and no one else. There was no other like it in any of the stores. And she had turned all of them inside out. It was a platinum fob chain, simple and chaste in design, properly proclaiming its value by substance alone and not by meretricious ornamentation, as all good things should do. It was even worthy of the watch. As soon as she saw it, she knew that it must be Jim's. It was like him. Quietness and value, the description applied to both. Twenty-one dollars they took from her for it, and she hurried home with the eighty-seven cents. With that chain on his watch, Jim might be properly anxious about the time in any company. Grand as the watch was, he sometimes looked at it on the sly on account of the old leather strap that he used in place of a chain. When Della reached home, her intoxication gave way a little to prudence and reason. She got out her curling irons and lighted the gas and went to work repairing the ravages made by generosity added to love, which is always a tremendous task, dear friends, a mammoth task. 
Within forty minutes her head was covered with tiny, close-lying curls that made her look wonderfully like a truant schoolboy. She looked at her reflection in the mirror, long, carefully, and critically. If Jim doesn't kill me, she said to herself before he takes a second look at me, he'll say I look like a Coney Island chorus girl. But what could I do? Oh, what could I do with a dollar and eighty-seven cents? At seven o'clock, the coffee was made, and the frying pan was on the back of the stove, hot and ready to cook the chops. Jim was never late. Della doubled the fob chain in her hand and sat on the corner of the table near the door that he always entered. Then she heard his steps on the stairway down on the first flight, and she turned white for just a moment. She had a habit of saying a little silent prayer about the simplest everyday things, and now she whispered, "'Please, God, make him think I'm still pretty.' The door opened, and Jim stepped in and closed it. He looked thin and very serious. Poor fellow, he was only twenty-two, and to be burdened with a family. He needed a new overcoat, and he was without gloves. Jim stopped inside the door, as immovable as a setter at the scent of quail. His eyes were fixed upon Della, and there was an expression in them that she could not read, and it terrified her. It was not anger, nor surprise, nor disapproval, nor horror, or any of the sentiments that she had been prepared for. He simply stared at her fixedly with that peculiar expression on his face. Della wriggled off the table and went for him. "'Jim, darling,' she cried, "'don't look at me that way. I had my hair cut off and sold because I, I couldn't have lived through Christmas without giving you a present. It'll grow out again. You won't mind, will you? I just had to do it. My hair grows awfully fast. Say Merry Christmas, Jim, and let's be happy. You don't know what a nice, what a beautiful, nice gift I've got for you.' "'You've cut off your hair?' asked Jim laboriously, as if he had not arrived at that patent fact yet even after the hardest mental labor. "'Cut it off and sold it,' said Della. "'Don't you like me just as well, anyhow? I'm me without my hair, ain't I?' Jim looked about the room curiously. "'You say your hair's gone,' he said, with an air of almost idiocy. "'You needn't look for it,' said Della. "'It's sold, I tell you, sold and gone, too. "'It's Christmas Eve, boy. Be good to me, for it went for you. "'Maybe the hairs of my head were numbered,' she went on with sudden serious sweetness, "'but nobody could ever count my love for you. "'Shall I put the chops on, Jim?' "'Out of his trance, Jim seemed quickly to wake. "'He enfolded his Della.' For ten seconds let us regard with discreet scrutiny some inconsequential object in the other direction. Eight dollars a week, or a million a year. What is the difference? A mathematician or a wit would give you the wrong answer. The Magi brought valuable gifts, but that was not among them. This dark assertion will be illuminated later on. Jim drew a package from his overcoat pocket and threw it upon the table. "'Don't make any mistake, Dell. he said, about me. "'I don't think there's anything in the way of a haircut or a shave or a shampoo "'that could make me like my girl any less. "'But if you'll unwrap that package, you may see why you had me going a while at first. "'White fingers and nimble tore at the string and paper. "'And then an ecstatic scream of joy, and then, alas, a quick feminine change "'to hysterical tears and wails.' necessitating the immediate employment of all the comforting powers of the lord of the flat. For there lay the combs, the set of combs, side and back, that Della had worshipped long in a Broadway window. Beautiful combs, pure tortoise shell with jeweled rims, just the shade to wear in the beautiful, vanished hair. They were expensive combs, she knew, and her heart had simply craved and yearned over them without the least hope of possession. And now they were hers, but the tresses that should have adorned the coveted adornments were gone. But she hugged them to her bosom, and at length she was able to look up with dim eyes and a smile and say, My hair grows so fast, Jim. And then Della leaped up like a singed cat and cried, Oh, oh! Jim had not yet seen his beautiful present. She held it out to him eagerly upon her open palm. 
the dull, precious metal seemed to flash with the reflection of her bright and ardent spirit. Isn't it dandy, Jim? I hunted all over town to find it. You'll have to look at the time a hundred times a day now. Give me your watch. I want to see how it looks on it. Instead of obeying, Jim tumbled down on the couch and put his hands under the back of his head and smiled. Dell, said he, let's put our Christmas presents away and keep them a while. They're too nice to use just at present. I sold the watch to get the money to buy your combs. And now suppose you put the chops on. The Magi, as you know, were wise men, wonderfully wise men, who brought gifts to the babe in the manger. They invented the art of giving Christmas presents. Being wise, their gifts were no doubt wise ones, possibly bearing the privilege of exchange in case of duplication. And here I have lamely related to you the uneventful chronicle of two foolish children in a flat who most unwisely sacrificed for each other the greatest treasures of their house. But in a last word to the wise of these days, let it be said that of all who give gifts, these two were the wisest. Of all who give and receive gifts, such as they are wisest. Everywhere they are wisest. They are the Magi. End of The Gift of the Magi by O. Henry Recording by Deborah Lee Fireside Christmas Short Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fireside Christmas Short Stories by Various The Eve of St. Nicholas by Faith Wynne In a neat little house in an old-fashioned German village on the banks of the beautiful Rhine, with flat meadows and broad fields and roads bordered with tall poplars, there lived a happy family by the name of Lichtenfels. There were two daughters named Christine and Alice, the sunlight of the home where clouds were rare. One month, however, before the advent of St. Nicholas Day, something unusual occurred, and this something was a troubled pucker on the white forehead of little Alice, and as she watched the nimble fingers of Christine slipping the stitches off and on, on and off her shining needles, she sighed so deeply that the sister asked anxiously, what ails thee, Liebchen? I am so afraid that St. Nicholas will ask me again this year if I can knit, she replied with a quiver in her voice. So he will, Alice, so he will. And what canst thou answer? The mother wanted to teach thee, but thou wouldst not learn. I know I was naughty not to obey. If I learn now, will St. Nicholas pardon me? I am sure he will. "'Then I will learn before the month is out,' said Alice, skipping after Christine to get the yarn and needles. And a pretty picture the mother found when she entered the room a while later. The smiling sisters were seated side by side on the wooden settee. Christine's arms were half bared, for it was one of those warm October days which with us will call the squirrel and the bee from out their winter home and her fair head was bowed until it almost touched the flaxen locks of the child, her face eager and flushed as she guided the awkward little fingers through the stitches that seemed so determined to drop out of line. Patience and perseverance are fine partners and generally accomplish their aim. When the eve of the 5th of November rolled around, Alice was ready to enjoy with an untroubled heart the sights in the window of the conditorai, confectioner's shop, where many little wooden-shod feet pattered that night to buy a chocolate shoe and to admire the picture cakes of immense roosters with flowing tails and lordly crests, ladies in ruffs and knights in armour with sword and lance, St. Nicholas on a white horse being the most frequent figure. These picture cakes are made in wooden moulds, thick square blocks of wood with the form to be made deeply cut into them. The dough is pressed firmly into this cutting until it takes its shape, when it is removed and baked. 
most plentiful of all the pretty toys are little candy shoes generally made of brown chocolate with white rosettes and trimmings which are always expected to be provided to hold food for st nicholas's white horse when the good saint comes in the night with his gifts and sad is the heart of the child who cannot find a groschen to buy one there was such a one standing close to christine who whispered that she could not afford a chocolate shoe so she had made one of potato and would put the oats in it adding the fervent hope that st nicholas would not be angry of course he will not said christine he will know you did your best and that is all any of us can do that night there were many children in this little village in a state of great excitement filling the shoes for the white steed with rye or oats or sugar and blacking their own until they could almost see themselves in them which were then placed upon a table beside their beds close to the chocolate shoes this preparation is made with their hearts in their mouths for they are expecting any moment to hear st nicholas's bell announcing his approach finally it comes ting a ling ling sounding clearly in the still night air the door is opened politely by the mother who bids him enter at one side he carries a long well-filled bag and in one hand a bundle of rods he bows graciously and says as christmas is so near the christkind has sent him to each home to see where he must bring presents on that blessed day he asks the trembling Alice, who clings to her mother's arm, whether she has yet learned to knit, and a smile passes over his face when she almost shrieks out in her excitement and earnestness, Yes, yes, good St. Nicholas! He then assures her that she and all the good children will find a gift from out his well-filled sack beside their beds in the morning which will be as a promise to them that on christmas eve the christ child will bring more beautiful presents the day scarcely dawns before the village children begin to peep around and alas for the naughty ones who find only a bundle of sticks the good boys and girls however are delighted with the picture cakes that adorn the little stand at their bedside laid carefully across the top of alice's shoe is a large cake made in the shape of a stocking marked for the little girl who has learned the useful art of knitting and the potato shoe in a poorer part of the village is filled with the sweetest of sweets and a card lay beside it upon which was written she did the best she could when christmas day came with all its hopes and fears for the childish heart the promises of st nicholas were fulfilled the christ child remembered the good with bounteous and beauteous gifts and the birch rods left by old pelts nicol we may believe kept the naughty children in order the next year but you know that is not the most acceptable goodness which grows out of a desire of reward or fear of punishment may the glad christmas find you and keep you good because it is right to be good end of the eve of st nicholas by faith wynne recording by ruth golding Fireside Christmas Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fireside Christmas Stories by Various. The Little Match Girl by Hans Christian Andersen. Recording by Sarah Swart. It was dreadfully cold. It was snowing fast and was almost dark as evening came on, the last evening of the year. In the cold and the darkness, there went along the street a poor little girl, bareheaded and with naked feet. When she left home, she had slippers on, it is true, but they were much too large for her feet, slippers that her mother had used until then, and the poor little girl lost them in running across the street when two carriages were passing terribly fast. When she looked for them, one was not to be found, and a boy seized the other and ran away with it, saying he would use it for a cradle some day when he had children of his own. So on the little girl went, 
with her bare feet that were red and blue with cold in an old apron that she wore were bundles of matches and she carried a bundle also in her hand no one had bought so much as a bunch all day long and no one had given her even a penny poor little girl shivering with cold and hunger she crept along a perfect picture of misery the snowflakes fell on her long flaxen hair which hung in pretty curls about her throat but she thought not of her beauty nor of the cold lights gleamed in every window and there came to her the savory smell of roast goose for it was new year's eve and it was of this which she thought in a corner formed by two houses one of which projected beyond the other she sat cowering down she had drawn under her little feet but still she grew colder and colder yet she dared not go home for she had sold no matches and could not bring a penny of money her father would certainly beat her and besides it was cold enough at home for they had only the house roof above them and though the largest holes had been stopped with straw and rags there were left many through which the cold wind whistled and now her little hands were nearly frozen with cold alas a single match might do her good if she might only draw it from the bundle rub it against the wall and warm her fingers by it so at last she drew one out Whisht! how it blazed and burned it gave out a warm bright flame like a little candle and she held her hands over it a wonderful little light it was it really seemed to the little girl as if she sat before a great iron stove with polished brass feet and brass shovel and tongs so blessedly it burned that the little maiden stretched out her feet to warm them also how comfortable she was but lo the flame went out the stove vanished and nothing remained but the little burned match in her hand she rubbed another match against the wall it burned brightly and where the light fell upon the wall it became transparent like a veil so that she could see through it into the room a snow-white cloth was spread upon the table on which was a beautiful china dinner service while a roast goose stuffed with apples and prunes steamed famously and sent forth a most savory smell and what was more delightful still and wonderful the goose jumped from the dish with knife and fork still in its breast and waddled along the floor straight to the little girl but the match went out then and nothing was left to her but the thick damp wall she lighted another match and now she was under a most beautiful christmas tree larger and far more prettily trimmed than one she had seen through the glass doors at the rich merchants hundreds of wax tapers were burning on the green branches and gay figures such as she had seen in the shop windows looked down upon her the child stretched out her hands to them then the match went out still the lights of the christmas tree rose higher and higher she saw them as stars in heaven and one of them fell forming a long trail of fire now someone is dying murmured the child softly for her grandmother the only person who had loved her and who was now dead had told her that whenever a star falls a soul mounts up to god she struck yet another match against the wall and again it was light and in the brightness there appeared before her the dear old grandmother bright and radiant yet sweet and mild and happy as she had never looked on earth oh grandmother cried the child take me with you i know you will go away when the match burns out you too will vanish like the warm stove the splendid new year's feast the beautiful christmas tree and lest her grandmother should disappear she rubbed the whole bunch of matches against the wall and the matches burned with such a brilliant light that it became brighter than noonday her grandmother had never looked so grand and beautiful she took the little girl in her arms and both flew together joyously and gloriously mounting higher and higher far above the earth and for them there was neither hunger nor cold nor care they were with god but in the corner at the dawn of day sat the poor girl leaning against the wall with red cheeks and smiling mouth frozen to death on the last evening of the old year stiff and cold she sat with the matches one bundle of which was burned she wanted to warm herself poor little thing people said no one imagined what sweet vision she had had or how gloriously she had gone with her grandmother to enter upon the joys of a new year end of the little match girl by hans christian anderson recording by sarah swart fireside christmas short stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Fireside Christmas Short Stories by Various The Star 
by Florence M. Kingsley. Recording by Pam Castile. Once upon a time, in a country far away from here, there lived a little girl named Ruth. Ruth's home was not at all like our houses, for she lived in a little tower on top of the great stone wall that surrounded the town of Bethlehem. Ruth's father was the hotel keeper, the Bible says the innkeeper. This inn was not at all like our hotels either. There was a great open yard which was called the courtyard. All about this yard were little rooms, and each traveller who came to the hotel rented one. The inn stood near the great stone wall of the city, so that as Ruth stood one night looking out of the tower window, she looked directly into the courtyard. It was truly a strange sight that met her eyes. So many people were coming to the inn, for the king had made a law that every man should come back to the city where his father used to live to be counted and to pay his taxes. Some of the people came on the backs of camels, with great rolls of bedding and their dishes for cooking upon the back of the beast. Some of them came on little donkeys, and on their backs too were the bedding and the dishes. Some of the people came walking. Slowly they were so tired. Many miles some of them had come. As Ruth looked down into the courtyard, she saw the camels being led to their places by their masters. She heard the snap of the whips. She saw the sparks shoot up from the fires that were kindled in the courtyard, where each person was preparing his own supper. She heard the cries of the tired, hungry little children. Presently her mother, who was cooking supper, came over to the window and said, "'Ruthie, thou shalt hide in the house until all these people are gone. Dost thou understand?' Yes, my mother, said the child, and she left the window to follow her mother back to the stove, limping painfully, for little Ruth was a cripple. Her mother stooped suddenly and caught the child in her arms. My poor little lamb, it was a mule's kick just six years ago that hurt your poor back and made you lame. Never mind, my mother, my back does not ache today, and lately when the light of the strange new star has shone down upon my bed, my back has felt so much stronger, and I have felt so happy, as though I could climb upon the rays of the star and up, up into the sky and above the stars. Her mother shook her head sadly. Thou art not likely to climb much now or ever. But come, the supper is ready. Let us go to find your father. I wonder what keeps him. They found the father standing at the gate of the courtyard, talking to a man and woman who had just arrived. The man was tall, with a long beard, and he led by a rope a snow-white mule, on which sat the drooping figure of the woman. As Ruth and her mother came near, they heard the father say, But I tell thee that there is no more room at the inn. Hast thou no friends where thou canst go to spend the night? The man shook his head. No, none, he answered. I care not for myself, but my poor wife. Little Ruth pulled at her mother's dress. Mother, the oxen sleep out under the stars these warm nights, and the straw in the caves is clean and warm. I have made a bed there for my little lamb. Ruth's mother bowed before the tall man. Thou didst hear the child. It is as she says. The straw is clean and warm. The tall man bowed his head. We shall be very glad to stay. And he helped the sweet-faced woman down from the donkey's back and led her away to the cave stable, while the little Ruth and her mother hurried up the stairs that they might send a bowl of porridge to the sweet-faced woman and a sup of new milk as well. That night, when little Ruth lay down in her bed, the rays of the beautiful new star shone through the window more brightly than before. They seemed to soothe the tired, aching shoulders. She fell asleep and dreamed that the beautiful bright star burst, and out of it came countless angels who sang in the night. 
Glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, good will to men. And then it was morning, and her mother was bending over her and saying, Awake, awake, little Ruth, mother has something to tell thee. Then as the eyes opened slowly, the angels came in the night, little one, and left a baby to lay beside your little white lamb in the manger. That afternoon Ruth went with her mother to the fountain. The mother turned aside to talk to the other women of the town about the strange things heard and seen the night before. But Ruth went on and sat down by the edge of the fountain. The child was not frightened, for strangers came often to the well, but never had she seen men who looked like the three who now came towards her. The first one, a tall man with a long white beard, came close to Ruth and said, Canst tell us, child, where is born he that is called the king of the Jews? I know of no king, she answered, but last night while the star was shining, the angels brought a baby to lie beside my white lamb in the manger. The stranger bowed his head. That must be he. Wilt thou show us the way to him, my child? So Ruth ran, and her mother led the three men to the cave, and when they saw the child, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy, and opening their gifts, they presented unto him gold and frankincense and myrrh, with wonderful jewels, so that Ruth's mother's eyes shone with wonder. But little Ruth saw only the baby, which lay asleep on its mother's breast. If only I might hold him in my arms, she thought, but was afraid to ask. After a few days the strangers left Bethlehem, all but the three, the man whose name was Joseph, and Mary his wife, and the baby. Then, as of old, little Ruth played about the courtyard, and the white lamb frolicked at her side. Often she dropped to her knees to press the little woolly white head against her breast while she murmured, My little lamb, my very, very own, I love you, lammy and then together they would steal over to the entrance of the cave to peep in at the baby, and always she thought, if I only might touch his hand, but was afraid to ask. One night, as she lay in her bed, she thought to herself, Oh, I wish I had a beautiful gift for him, such as the wise men brought, but I have nothing at all to offer, and I love him so much. Just then the light of the star, which was nightly fading, fell across the foot of the bed and shone full upon the white lamb which lay asleep at her feet. And then she thought of something. The next morning she arose with her face shining with joy. She dressed carefully, and with the white lamb held close to her breast, went slowly and painfully down the stairway and over to the door of the cave. I have come, she said, to worship him, and I have brought him my white lamb. The mother smiled at the lame child, then she lifted the baby from her breast and placed him in the arms of the little maid who knelt at her feet. A few days after, an angel came to the father Joseph and told him to take the baby and hurry to the land of Egypt, for the wicked king wanted to do it harm. And so these three, the father, mother, and baby, went by night to the far country of Egypt and the star grew dimmer and dimmer, and passed away forever from the skies over Bethlehem. But little Ruth grew straight and strong and beautiful as the almond trees in the orchard, and all the people who saw her were amazed, for Ruth was once a cripple. It was the light of the strange star, her mother said, but little Ruth knew it was the touch of the blessed Christ child who was once folded against her heart. End of The Star by Florence M. Kingsley Recording by Pam Castile Fireside Christmas Short Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fireside Christmas Short Stories by Various The Baby's Things 
a story in verse for christmas eve by edward abbott one the work of the day had been laid aside and now in the edge of the even tide she lingered a while in her favorite seat by a window that overlooked the street silent and thoughtful dreamy and sad strangely so for a time so glad but the sombre hue of the dress she wore and the look of sorrow her features bore showed that it had been hers to know the weight of a father's chastening blow there she sat leaning and looking away over the snow that covered the ground over the buildings that clustered round over the hills that rose beyond at the lingering sunset's rich display she watched the shapes as they came and went the sinking sun as his brightness spent and as she watched the scene seemed changed and forms and colors were rearranged until a glimpse as she fancied came of the heavenly city jerusalem the city that knew no setting sun no dawning day and no night begun the glory of god its unfading light and the lamb that was slain its radiance bright nor did fancy end its painting here the picture became more full and clear the cloudy masses that banked the sky were the walls of the city great and high in the glowing bars she would fain behold the streets of the city of shining gold the fragments outlined with graceful curl stood for the several gates of pearl and the mellow twilight that round her shone seemed the light of the precious jasper stone just one year ago this christmas eve how could the mother do else than grieve her baby died a beautiful boy her welcome care and her constant joy in an hour such as she little thought the summons came and the child was not the year had passed but sorrow still remained the mother's cup to fill and now as the festal hour returned and her heart with fresh affection burned her loss seemed greater than before her burden increasing more and more so as she lingered and looked away at the winter sunset's rich display the city which fancy had wrought afar out of cloudy bank and curl and bar became the home of her angel child and the thought her sorrow in part beguiled a moment more and the sun went down behind the hills that engirt the town and its fading beams began to weave the welcome shadows of christmas eve two oh what a flood of reflections brings the sight of a dear dead baby's things the snow-white slips so simple and neat socks that would do for a cherub's feet blankets of flannel so soft and warm against the chill of the winter's storm wrappers of muslin so thin and cool for the days of the sultry summer's rule the jaunty cap with its crisp rosette the quilted jacket of satinette the gossamer veil to shield the face the dainty shoes with their ties in place the zephyr sacks with their borders bright the cloak with its cape so warm but light every possible color and hue crimson and orange purple and blue oh this was a wardrobe rich and fair as ever a baby boy did wear 
thus sat the mother this christmas eve bending over the bureau drawer turning its contents o'er and o'er examining every little sleeve smoothing out fondly the flowing skirts opening and folding the knitted shirts sadly caressing the empty shoes assorting the little socks by twos spreading the wrappers upon her knees stroking the blankets silky frieze and dropping on every garment dear the fresh perfume of a tender tear there they had lain from the very day that the baby died and to give away these things for some other child to wear was a thought the mother could never bear true they were useless lying there she might never want them herself again some at least she might easily spare and let the rest in their place remain what a godsend even a few would be to many a child of poverty this had always been her thought before whenever she looked the bureau through and to-night the thought returned anew as she handled the little garments o'er and seeing them placed in layers even without spot or wrinkle or any such thing smoothed as if by an angel's wing and cleansed as if by a breath from heaven she was led to think of moth and rust of thieves and fire and damp and dust and to feel that treasures are not enjoyed unless in generous ways employed there was margaret mills the carver's wife did ever one lead a harder life her husband's earnings were quite too scant to supply in full their daily want and with all her children now to rear her time of sorrow again drew near what could a baby hope to find for itself in an already crowded nest its needs would be great all hearts would be kind but now there was scarcely enough for the rest poor margaret many a heavy sigh she had uttered when no one else was nigh to think of the new life soon to come into her empty and cheerless home and she wondered what she should ever do if god should carry her safely through all this the mother remembered well as she lingered under the bureau's spell in many a generous way indeed she had proved herself a friend in need and at this hour the thought would rise as she wiped the tears from her brimming eyes how much better every way twould be to follow the bidding of charity and make up for margaret mills poor soul out of these garments a bountiful roll but no sooner did such a thought occur than a motherly instinct would demur she pitied the poor she would gladly give of her ample substance to help them live money and time she would cheerfully spend and other assistance with pleasure lend to relieve their wants and their sorrows ease but she could not part with such things as these three pondering thus the present and past as the winter twilight faded fast over the sorrowing mother's soul sleep and a vision gently stole she seemed to have gone to a distant clime back far back in a former time the hour was early in the night and the sky was filled with a wondrous light in the midst of which one shining star scattered its glorious beams afar while on her ear rose loud and long 
a joyful chorus of heavenly song she had entered borne by urgent feet a town on the hillside all the street was filled with a busy roving throng which hardly she made her way among yonder she noticed a crowded inn her ear could easily catch its din while just beyond was a rocky cave what a glory lit up its rough-hewn nave a mother was lying there at rest with a babe asleep on her pillowy breast her husband stood wondering at her side looking with love on his virgin bride it was there was no mistaking them it was the manger of bethlehem yes there were the shepherds out of the field who had left their flocks with none to shield and there were the wise men out of the east rejoiced that their pilgrimage had ceased the infant jesus she really saw was it strange that her soul should thrill with awe but strangely enough she seemed to see as she neared the sleeping child that he who should call his own neither house nor lands was now without even swaddling bands her lord in need in a moment more she had opened wide the bureau drawer and dreaming still searched its contents o'er with generous purpose and eager hands there is nothing she cried i would not spare for the babe of bethlehem to wear and she dared to hope that the gift thus made and now at the feet of the young child laid would be as worthy a gift from her as the wise man's frankincense gold and myrrh a moment more and the vision went the mother woke with a sudden start the winter twilight was fully spent the moon had begun her slow ascent and the heaven was starred in every part the scene before her had passed away with the last dull tints of the parting day while instead before her very eyes the figure of margaret seemed to rise and at that moment she thought she heard out of the stillness the heavenly word what shall it profit to say to the poor depart in peace from my generous door while notwithstanding ye give them not of the needful things for which they've sought if to one of the least of these is done naked or hungry a deed of love it is done to jesus on the throne and accepted by him who reigns above then the mother saw how her risen lord stood ready to take her at her word if margaret needed it was his need in her mute appeal she heard him plead who could resist such a tender call when the sacrifice was so very small four out from her dwelling and down the street the mother hastened with eager feet she carried a bundle in her hand the happiest woman in all the land the plentiful snow lay all around and the wind rushed by with a dreary sound but she minded neither the night nor cold her errand sufficing to make her bold down the snowy and blustering street past the policeman on his beat under the gas lamp's flickering light by the shop windows frosty and bright meeting many but noticing none bent on her errand of love alone over the river icy and chill 
along in the shadow of the mill and so at last to an alleyway dark at best in the light of day where in a tenement old and poor margaret lived on an upper floor quickly she opened the outer door and ridding her feet of the clinging snow made haste up the narrow stairs to go up several flights and through the halls she groped her way by the friendly walls margaret's door she easily found and gave a knock with a ringing sound she was hardly surprised that the first reply which her summons met was a baby's cry crowded the room it must serve for all father and mother and children small kitchen and parlor chamber and shop twas long since the floor had known the mop the plastering cracked had begun to drop the windows were narrow the ceiling low the air was close and the only light in the room was the fire's paling glow making itself by a contrast bright there in the corner margaret lay with her babe beside her born that day poor little thing it had cried with cold before it was scarcely an hour old its lot had been cast in a dreary clime and its birthday set in a wintry time and so what this mother came to bring was like a breath of the genial spring scarce a word was spoken the babe she took and pausing to give it one fond look seated herself by the dying fire and deftly put on its new attire at work in his corner the father kept and the tired children all soundly slept save one who lying upon her bed so managed to raise her eager head as to watch the movements one by one till the work of dressing was wholly done then again the babe was laid to rest close to its mother's sheltering breast and when she beheld the garments fair which her little one was now to wear the knitted shirts for its body red the socks for its twisting curling feet the snow-white slip so simple and neat and the blanket around its furry head her heart was filled with a sweet content and she said to herself the lord hath sent his servant to me this gift to bear and her quick thanksgiving to heaven went to him who had made her wants his care but none the less was a pleasure given to her who had brought the welcome gift and she felt constrained her heart to lift in a silent tearful prayer to heaven for it seemed to her that to the lord she had made this gift this christmas eve would he be true to his spoken word she asked herself and her gift receive five the hour was late and the town was still when the mother set forth on her homeward way out of the alley and past the mill and through the streets where the moonbeams lay but she minded neither the cold nor night her step was firm and her heart was light for she thought of the babe of bethlehem and held that her errand had been to him wondered that she had so long refrained remembered her treasures that remained discovered within a ready mind some other case of distress to find 
saw how it was that they truly live who freely receiving freely give and resolved that henceforth her life should be to follow the bidding of charity dear reader this world of ours is full of just such mothers and margaret's too too many life is one long hard pull to others a want would be something new here is the overstocked bureau drawer and there is the empty suffering home here of bread there is plentiful store and there is the mouth beseeching some and to bring the supply to those who need the naked to clothe and the hungry feed cool water to give from the springing well to go to the prisoner in his cell to visit the sick on the bed of pain the benighted stranger to entertain and wherever a want is seen to be to labor to meet it abundantly to do all this for the dear lord's sake and the needed sacrifice gladly make this it is surely the lord to please even if done to the least of these open then wide the friendly door freely part with the treasured store bend the ear when the suffering plead give of the best to those in need let nothing too good or too sacred be for use in the service of charity and learn as one lesson for christmas eve tis more blessed to give than to receive end of the baby's things by edward abbott fireside christmas short stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org fireside christmas short stories by various little girl's christmas by winifred e lincoln recording by pam castile it was christmas eve and little girl had just hung up her stocking by the fireplace right where it would be all ready for santa when he slipped down the chimney she knew he was coming because well because it was christmas eve and because he always had come to leave gifts for her on all the other christmas eves that she could remember and because she had seen his pictures everywhere downtown that afternoon when she was out with mother still she wasn't just satisfied way down in her heart she was a little uncertain you see when you have never really and truly seen a person with your very own eyes it's hard to feel as if you exactly believed in him even though that person always has left beautiful gifts for you every time he has come oh he'll come said little girl i just know he will be here before morning but somehow i wish well what do you wish said a tiny voice close by her so close that little girl fairly jumped when she heard it why i wish i could see santa myself i'd just like to go and see his house and his workshop and ride in his sleigh and know mrs santa twould be such fun and then i'd know for sure why don't you go then said tiny voice it's easy enough just try on these shoes and take this light in your hand and you'll find your way all right so little girl looked down on the hearth and there were two cunning little shoes side by side and a little spark of a light close to them 
just as if they were all made out of one of the glowing coals of the wood fire such cunning shoes as they were little girl could hardly wait to pull off her slippers and try them on they looked as if they were too small but they weren't they fitted exactly right and just as little girl had put them both on and had taken the light in her hand along came a little breath of wind and away she went up the chimney along with ever so many other little sparks past the soot fairies and out into the open air where jack frost and the star beams were all busy at work making the world look pretty for christmas away went little girl two shoes bright light and all higher and higher until she looked like a wee bit of a star up in the sky it was the funniest thing but she seemed to know the way perfectly and didn't have to stop to make inquiries anywhere you see it was a straight road all the way and when one doesn't have to think about turning to the right or the left it makes things very much easier pretty soon the little girl noticed that there was a bright light all around her oh a very bright light and right away something down in her heart began to make her feel very happy indeed she didn't know that the christmas spirits and little christmas fairies were all around her and even right inside her because she couldn't see a single one of them even though her eyes were very bright and could usually see a great deal but that was just it and little girl felt as if she wanted to laugh and sing and be glad it made her remember the sick boy who lived next door and she said to herself that she would carry him one of her prettiest picture books in the morning so that he could have something to make him happy all day by and by when the bright light all around her had grown very very much brighter little girl saw a path right in front of her all straight and trim leading up a hill to a big big house with ever and ever so many windows in it when she had gone just a bit nearer she saw candles in every window red and green and yellow ones and every one burning brightly so little girl knew right away that these were christmas candles to light her on her journey and make the way dear for her and something told her that this was santa's house and that pretty soon she would perhaps see santa himself just as she neared the steps and before she could possibly have had time to ring the bell the door opened opened of itself as wide as could be and there stood not santa himself don't think it but a funny little man with slender little legs and a roly-poly stomach which shook every now and then when he laughed you would have known right away just as little girl knew that he was a very happy little man and you would have guessed right away too that the reason he was so roly-poly was because he laughed and chuckled and smiled all the time for it's only sour cross folks who are thin and skimpy quick as a wink he pulled off his little peaked red cap smiled the broadest kind of a smile and said merry christmas merry christmas come in come in so in went little girl holding fast to little man's hand and when she was really inside there was the jolliest reddest fire all glowing and snapping and there were little men and all his brothers and sisters who said their names were merry christmas and good cheer and ever so many other jolly sounding things and there were such a lot of them that little girl just knew she never could count them no matter how long she tried 
all around her were bundles and boxes and piles of toys and games and little girl knew that these were all ready and waiting to be loaded into santa's big sleigh for his reindeer to whirl them away over cloud tops and snow drifts to the little people down below who had left their stockings all ready for him pretty soon all the little good cheer brothers began to hurry and bustle and carry out the bundles as fast as they could to the steps where little girl could hear the jingling bells and the stamping of hooves so little girl picked up some bundles and skipped along too for she wanted to help a bit herself it's no fun whatever at christmas unless you can help you know and there in the yard stood the biggest sleigh that little girl had ever seen and the reindeer were all stamping and prancing and jingling the bells on their harnesses because they were so eager to be on their way to the earth once more she could hardly wait for santa to come and just as she had begun to wonder where he was the door opened again and out came a whole forest of christmas trees at least it looked just as if a whole forest had started out for a walk somewhere but a second glance showed little girl that there were thousands of christmas sprites and that each one carried a tree or a big christmas wreath on his back behind them all she could hear someone laughing loudly and talking in a big jovial voice that sounded as if he were good friends with the whole world and straightway she knew that santa himself was coming little girl's heart went pit-a-pat for a minute while she wondered if santa would notice her but she didn't have to wonder long for he spied her at once and said bless my soul who's this and where did you come from little girl thought perhaps she might be afraid to answer him but she wasn't one bit afraid you see he had such a kind little twinkle in his eyes that she felt happy right away as she replied oh i'm little girl and, and i wanted so much to see santa that i just came and here i am ho 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 laughed santa and here you are wanted to see santa did you and so you came now that's very nice and it's too bad i'm in such a hurry for we should like nothing better than to show you about and give you a real good time but you see it is quarter of twelve now and i must be on my way at once else i'll never reach that first chimney top by midnight i'd call mrs santa and ask her to get you some supper but she is busy finishing doll's clothes which must be done before morning and i guess we'd better not bother her is there anything that you would like little girl and good old santa put his big warm hand on little girl's curls and she felt its warmth and kindness clear down to her very heart you see my dears that even though santa was in such a great hurry he wasn't too busy to stop and make someone happy for a minute even if it was someone no bigger than little girl so she smiled back into santa's face and said oh santa if i could only ride down to earth with you behind those splendid reindeer i'd love to go won't you please take me i'm so small that i won't take up much room on the seat and i'll keep very still and not bother one bit then santa laughed such a laugh big and loud and rollicking and he said wants a ride does she well well shall we take her little elves shall we take her little fairies shall we take her good reindeer 
and all the little elves hopped and skipped and brought little girl a sprig of holly and all the little fairies bowed and smiled and brought her a bit of mistletoe and all the good reindeer jingled their bells loudly which meant oh yes let's take her she's a good little girl let her ride and before little girl could even think she found herself all tucked up in the big fur robes beside santa and away they went right out into the air over the clouds through the milky way and right under the very handle of the big dipper on on toward the earthland whose lights little girl began to see twinkling away down below her presently she felt the runners scrape upon something and she knew they must be on someone's roof and that santa would slip down someone's chimney in a minute how she wanted to go too you see if you had never been down a chimney and seen santa fill up the stockings you would want to go quite as much as little girl did now wouldn't you so just as little girl was wishing as hard as ever she could wish she heard a tiny voice say hold tight to his arm hold tight to his arm so she held santa's arm tight and close and he shouldered his pack never thinking that it was heavier than usual and with a bound and a slide there they were santa little girl pack and all right in the middle of a room where there was a fireplace and stockings all hung up for santa to fill just then santa noticed little girl he had forgotten all about her for a minute and he was very much surprised to find that she had come too bless my soul he said where did you come from little girl and how in the world can we both get back up that chimney again it's easy enough to slide down but it's quite another matter to climb up again and santa looked real worried but little girl was beginning to feel very tired by this time for she had had a very exciting evening so she said oh never mind me santa i've had such a good time and i'd just as soon stay here a while as not i believe i'll curl up on his hearthrug a few minutes and have a little nap for it looks as warm and cozy as our own hearthrug at home and why it is our own hearth and it's my own nursery for there is teddy bear in his chair where i leave him every night and there's bunny cat curled up on his cushion in the corner and little girl turned to thank santa and say good-bye to him but either he had gone very quickly or else she had fallen asleep very quickly she never could tell which for the next thing she knew daddy was holding her in his arms and was saying what is my little girl doing here she must go to bed for it's christmas eve and old santa won't come if he thinks there are any little folks about but little girl knew better than that and when she began to tell him all about it and how the christmas fairies had welcomed her and how santa had given her such a fine ride daddy laughed and laughed and said you've been dreaming little girl you've been dreaming but little girl knew better than that too for there on the hearth was the little black coal which had given her two shoes and bright light and tight in her hand she held a holly berry which one of the christmas sprites had placed there more than all that there she was on the hearthrug herself just as santa had left her and that was the best proof of all the trouble was daddy himself had never been a little girl so he couldn't tell anything about it but we know she hadn't been dreaming now don't we my dears end of little girl's christmas Recording by Pam Castile
Fireside Christmas Short Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fireside Christmas Short Stories by Various. Saint Nicholas by Horatio Alger, Jr. Recording by Claudia Salto In the far-off polar seas, far beyond the Hebrides, where the icebergs towering high seem to pierce the wintry sky, and the fur-clad Eskimo glides in sledges o'er the snow, dwells Saint Nick, the merry white, patron saint of Christmas night. Solid walls of massive ice, bearing many a quaint device, flanked by graceful turrets twain, clear as clearest porcelain, bearing at a lofty height Christ's pure cross in simple white, carven with surpassing art from an iceberg's crystal heart. Here St. Nick, in royal state, dwells until December late, clips the days at either end and the nights at each extend. Then, with his attendant sprites, scours the earth on wintry nights, bringing home in well-filled hands children's gifts from many lands. Here are whistles, tops, and toys meant to gladden little boys, skates and sleds that soon will glide o'er the ice or steep hillside. Here are dolls with flaxen curls, sure to charm the little girls, Christmas books with pictures gay for this welcome holiday. In the court the reindeer wait, fill the sledge with costly freight. As the first faint shadow falls, Promptly from his icy halls steps St. Nick and grasps the rein, and afar in measured time sounds the sleigh bell's silver chime. Like an arrow from the bow speed the reindeer o'er the snow. Onward now the loaded sleigh skirts the shores of Hudson's Bay. Onward, till the stunted tree gains a loftier majesty, and the curling smoke wreaths rise under less inclement skies. Built upon a hillside steep lies a city wrapped in sleep. Up and down the lonely street sleepy watchmen pace their beat. Little heeds them Santa Claus, not for him are human laws. With a leap he leaves the ground, scales the chimney at a bound. Five small stockings hang below, five small stockings in a row. From his pocket blithe St. Nick fills the waiting stockings quick, some with sweetmeats, some with toys, gifts for girls, and gifts for boys, mounts the chimney like a bird, and the bells are once more heard. Santa Claus, good Christmas saint, in whose heart no selfish taint, findeth place, some homes there be, where no stockings wait for thee, homes where sad young faces wear painful marks of want and care and the Christmas morning brings no fair hope of better things. Can you not some crumbs bestow on these children, steeped in woe, steal a single look of care which their sad young faces wear, from your overflowing store, give to them whose hearts are sore? No sad eyes should greet the morn when the infant Christ was born. End of St. Nicholas by Horatio Elger, Jr.
Fireside Christmas Short Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fireside Christmas Short Stories by Various. Christmas, Chapter 8 of Wilderness, a Journal of Quiet Adventure in Alaska by Rockwell Kent. Recording by David Wales. Thursday, December 19th this day is never to be forgotten so beautiful so calm so still with the earth and every branch and tree muffled in deep feathery new-fallen snow and all day the softest clouds have drifted lazily over the heaven shrouding the land here and there in veils of falling snow while elsewhere or through the snow itself the sun shone golden shadows dazzling peaks fairy tracery of branches against the blue summer sea it was a day to live and work could be forgotten so rockwell and i explored the woods at first reverently treading one path that the snow about us might still lie undisturbed but soon the cub in the boy broke out and he rolled in the deepest thickets shook the trees down upon himself lay still in the snow for me to cover him completely washed his face till it was crimson and wound up with a naked snow bath i photographed him standing thus in the deep snow at the water's edge with the mountains far off behind him then he dried himself at the roaring fire we'd made ready and felt like a new boy if that can be imagined we both sketched out of doors for a little while in the morning like young lady amateurs I tried it again two or three times throughout the day with indifferent results. It was too beautiful. We cut wood, too, and that went with a zest. While Rockwell dried himself after his bath, I searched in the woods for a Christmas tree and cut a fair-sized one at last for its top. Christmas is right upon us now. Tonight the cranberries stew on the stove. Friday, December 20th the beautiful snow is fast going under the falling rain with only five more days before christmas it is probable we'll have little if any snow on the ground then a snowless christmas in alaska this day was as uneventful as could be part of the morning was consumed in putting a new handle into the sledge-hammer it was too dark to paint long really hardly an hour of daylight these days slip by so easily and with so little accomplished only by burning midnight oil can much be done sunday december twenty second both yesterday and today it has poured rain they've not been unpleasant days however occasional let-ups have allowed us to cut wood and get water without inconvenience this morning olson fearing that a continuance of the mild weather would melt the ice in the lake and send his bags of fish to the bottom went out to the centre of the lake where they hung suspended through a hole in the ice and brought them in but so precarious has the ice become that he carried a rope and took me along in case of trouble to get out upon the ice we had to go some distance along the lake's shore returning we missed meeting rockwell who had gone to join us not for some time did it occur to me to call him it was well i did call the poor boy on not seeing us had suddenly concluded we were drowned a strip of water separated him from the ice he was on the point of wading into this at the moment i called him he was still terribly excited when he reached us both days i have been occupied with humble housewifely duties baking washing mending and now the cabin is adorned with our drying clothes here where water must be carried so far it is the wet days that are wash days darning is a wretched nuisance we should have socks enough to tide us over our stay here last night after rockwell had been put to bed i sat down and did two of the best drawings i have done at half-past twelve i finished them and then to calm my elation a bit for sleep read in the odyssey at this my second reading of the book it's as intensely interesting or more so than ever as a story it is incomparably better than the iliad to me it is full of suggestions for wonderful pictures 
Ten days from now it comes due for Olson to go to Seward. If only then we have mild calm weather. But as yet we have seen no steamer go to Seward since early in the month. It looks as if the steamship companies had combined to deprive Alaska of its Christmas mail and freight in a policy of making the deadlock with the government over the mail contracts intolerable. Meanwhile, instead of serving us, the jaunty little naval cruisers that summered here in idleness doubtless loaf away the winter months in comfortable southern ports. Monday, December 23rd up to this morning the hard warm rain continued and now the stars are all out and it might be thought a night in spring at eight thirty i walked over in sneakers and underwear for a moment's call on olson but he had gone to bed and now although we'll have no snow the weather is fair for christmas if olson believes as he says that christmas will pass as any other day he is quite wrong the tree waits to be set up and it will surely be a thing of beauty blazing with its many candles in this sombre log interior i've given up the idea of dressing olson as santa claus in goat's wool whiskers santa claus without presents would move us to tears there are a few little gifts a pocket knife and a kitchen set of knife fork and can opener for olson an old broken fountain pen for rockwell some sticks of candy and the dinner what shall it be wait it is midnight i've just finished a good drawing the lamp is about at its accustomed low mark yesterday it had to be filled twice those nights when without a clock i sat up so late and to so uncertain an hour i have discovered by the lamp and clock together to have been really long my bedtime then was after two or three o'clock but i arose later to-day i finished a little picture for olson and so did rockwell these were forgotten in my list of presents as i've just written it i have shown in my picture the king of the island himself striding out to feed the goats while billy rearing on his hind legs tries to steal the food on the way rockwell's picture is of olson surrounded by all the goats in a more peaceful mood olson's cabin is in the background i wish we had more to give the good old man at any rate he dines with us christmas eve we've cleaned the house stowed everything away upon shelves and hooks and in corners moved even my easel aside decorated the roof timbers with dense hemlock boughs stowed quantities of wood behind the stove for there must be no work on that holiday and now both rockwell and i are in a state of suppressed excitement over to-morrow what a strange thing nothing is coming to us no change in any respect in all the routine of our lives but what we make ourselves and yet the day looms so large and magnificent before us i suppose the greatest festivals of our lives are those at which we dance ourselves you need nothing from outside not even illusion certainly children need to be given scarcely an idea to develop out of it an atmosphere of mystery and expectation as real and thrilling to themselves as if it rested upon true belief well the tree is ready cut to length with a cross at the foot to stand upon and a cardboard and tinfoil star to hang at its top and now as to christmas weather this morning as might just as well have been expected was again overcast toward evening light snow began to fall it soon turned to rain and the rain now has settled down to a gentle even all night and day pace let it snow or rain and grow dark at midday the better shall be our good christmas cheer within this is the true christmas land the day should be dark the house further overshadowed by the woods tall and black and there in the midst of that sombre dreadful gloom the christmas tree should blaze in glory unrivalled by moon or sun or star christmas day on fox island it is mild the ground is almost bare and a warm rain falls 
First the Christmas tree, all dripping wet, is brought into the house and set upon its feet. It is nine feet and a half high and just touches the peak of the cabin. There it stands and dries its leaves while Rockwell and I prepare the feast. Both stoves are kept burning and the open door lets in the cool air. Everything goes beautifully. The wood burns as it should, the oven heats, the kettle boils, the beans stew, the bread browns in the oven just right, and the new pudding sauce foams up as rich and delicious as if instead of the first it were the hundredth time I've made it. And now everything is ready. The clock stands at a quarter to three. Night has about fallen, and lamplight is in the cabin run rockwell out of doors and play a while quickly i stow the presents about the tree hang sticks of candy from it and light the candles rockwell runs for mr olson and just as they approach the cabin the door opens and fairyland is revealed to them it is wonderful the interior of the cabin is illuminated as never before as perhaps no cabin interior ever was among these wild mountains then all amazed and wondering these two children come in who knows which is the more entranced then olson and i drink in deep solemnity a silent toast and the old man says i'd give everything yes everything i have in the world to have your wife here now and the presents are handed out for olson this picture from rockwell ah he thinks it's wonderful then for rockwell this book a surprise from seward next for olson a painting a kitchen set and a pocket knife by this time he's quite overcome it's the first Christmas he has ever had. And Rockwell, when he is handed two old copies of the Geographic magazine, cries in amazement, Why, I thought I was to have no presents. But he gets besides a pocket knife and the broken fountain pen, and sits on the bed looking at the things as if they were the most wonderful of gifts. Dinner is now set upon the table. Olson adjusts his glasses and reads the formal menu that lies at his place. So we feast and have a jolly good time. Menu, Fox Island Christmas, 1918. Hors d'oeuvres, olives, pickles. Entrees, spaghetti a la Fox Island. Roti, beans a la Resurrection Bay. Murphy's en casserole, cranberry sauce dessert plum pudding magnifique sauce a la alaskan rum demitasse nuts raisins bonbons home sweet home cider music by the german band it is a true party and looks like one rockwell and i are in clean white shirts olson is magnificent in a new flannel shirt and his sunday trousers and waistcoat he wears a silk tie and in it a gold nugget pin he is shaven and clipped about the ears how grand he looks the food is good and plentiful the night is long only the christmas candles are short-lived and we extinguish them to save them for another time finally as the night deepens olson leaves us amid mutual expressions of delight in each other's friendship and Rockwell and I tumble into bed. End of Christmas, Chapter 8 of Wilderness, A Journal of Quiet Adventure in Alaska by Rockwell Kent. Fireside Christmas Short Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fireside Christmas Short Stories by Various Her Birthday Dream by Nellie C. King Recording by Angela Marcia Brownlow came out of the church and walked rapidly down the street. She seemed perturbed. Her gray eyes flashed, and on her cheeks glowed two red spots. She was glad she was not going home so she wouldn't have to take a car, but could walk the short distance to Aunt Sophie's where she had been invited to dine and visit with her special chum, Cousin Jack. 
who was home from college for the short Thanksgiving vacation. She slowed up as she reached her destination and waited a little before going in. She wanted to get calmed down a bit, for she didn't want her friend to see her when she felt so riled up. Back of it was a secret reluctance to meet Jack. He was so different since the Gypsy Smith revival. Of course, he was perfectly lovely and unchanged toward her, but somehow she felt uncomfortable in his presence, and she didn't enjoy having her self-satisfaction disturbed. As she entered the dining room, she was greeted with exclamations of surprise and pleasure. "'Why, Marcia," said Aunt Sophia, "'we had given you up. I almost never knew of your being late in keeping an appointment. You must excuse me, Auntie, and lay this offense to the charge of our Sunday school superintendent,' answered Marcia. "'I suppose Mr. Robinson is laying his plans for Christmas,' remarked Uncle John. "'He believes in taking time by the forelock, and a very commendable habit it is, too.' "'Yes,' answered Marcia laconically. Jack glanced at her keenly. "'Is there anything new in the Christmas line?' he asked. The gray eyes grew black and the red spots burned again as Marcia replied, "'Well, I should think so. He proposes to turn things topsy-turvy.' "'My, what does he want to do?' inquired Cousin Augusta. "'Oh, he calls it the White Gift Christmas, but the long and short of the matter is that he proposes to turn down Santa Claus and all the old time-honored customs connected with Christmas that are so dear to the hearts of the children and have the school do the giving. He has a big banner hung up in the Sunday school room bearing the words, Gifts for the Christ Child.' "'An excellent idea,' exclaimed Uncle John. "'But I don't see much of an innovation about that. You have always made the children's giving a part of your Christmas celebration, have you not?' "'Certainly.' rejoined Marcia. They have always brought their little gifts for the poor, and that is all right, but this time there are no gifts to the Sunday school at all. Not even to the primary school? asked Augusta. Well, admitted Marcia, Mr. Robinson gave the children their choice today, whether they would have the old Christmas or the white gift Christmas, and they all voted for the new idea. Why then should the children be obliged to have gifts if they don't want them? laughed Augusta. No, children are always taken with novelty, and Mr. Robinson told it to them in such a way that fancy was captivated, but I don't think they really understood what they were giving up. Marcia, it seems to me that you are emphasizing the wrong side of the subject, if I understand it aright, said Jack. Why do you know about it? asked Marcia in surprise. Not much, replied Jack, but I've read the white gift story in the Sunday School Times and the report of the Painesville experiment. Well, Jack, tell us what you know about this mysterious white gift, commanded his father. I would rather Marcia should tell it, Father, I know so little. Oh, go on, Jack, urged Marcia. You can't possibly know less about it than I do, for I confess I was so full of the disappointment of the little ones that the other side of it didn't impress me very much. Well, as I remember it, said Jack, the gist of the plan is this, that Christmas is Christ's birthday and we should make our gifts to him instead of to one another, and the idea of the white gift was suggested by the story of the Persian king named Kubla Khan, who was a wise and good ruler and greatly beloved. On his birthday his subjects kept what they called the White Feast. This was celebrated in an immense great white banqueting hall, and each one of his subjects brought to their king a white gift to express that the love and loyalty of their hearts was without stain. The rich brought white chargers, ivory, and alabaster, the poor brought white pigeons, or even a measure of rice, and the great king regarded all gifts alike so long as they were white. "'Have I told it right, cousin?' queried Jack. "'Yes, I think so. It is a beautiful thought, I must confess, and might be all right in a large, rich Sunday school, but in a mission school like ours I am sure it will be a failure. It will end in our losing our scholars. I don't believe in taking up new ideas without considering whether they are adapted to our needs or not. But please, dear folkses, don't let us say anything more about it," pleaded Marcia, and so the subject was dropped. That evening, as Jack Thornton bade his cousin good-bye, he placed in her hand a little package, saying, I'm so sorry, Marcia, that I can't be here for your birthday, but here's my remembrance. Now don't you dare open it before Tuesday, and, dear, you may be sure it is a white gift, and may you have a white birthday. And before she could say a word, he had opened the door and was gone. Touched by his thoughtful gift and his words, she said to herself, A white birthday! I always have perfectly beautiful birthdays. And so she did, for she was always looking out for other people's birthdays and making much of them, and so she always got the gospel measure. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together, and running over, shall man give into your bosom. But these thoughts were crowded out by the pressure of things to be done. Father and mother had gone into the country to visit a sick friend, and the younger brothers and sisters surrounded her and clamored for songs and Bible stories, and as she was a good older sister she devoted herself to them until their bedtime. Then, turning out the lights, she sat down in an easy chair before the library grate, and yielded herself to the spell of the quiet hour. 
The strained, irritated nerves relaxed, and a strange, sweet peace stole over her. As she gazed dreamily into the fire, a star seemed to rise out of the glowing coals and beam at her with a beautiful, soft radiance, and the words of the evangel came into her mind. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding joy, and when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him, and when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. She repeated the words over and over to herself. How simple and restful they were! How direct and genuine and satisfying was this old-time giving! There it was, gifts for the Christ child. They presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. She remembered reading somewhere that the gold represented our earthly possessions, the frankincense typified our service, and the myrrh our suffering for his sake. As she gazed into the fire and mused, she fell asleep and all these thoughts were woven into the fabric of a dream. And who shall say that God does not speak to his children still in dreams? She dreamed that it was the morning of her birthday. She heard cheery voices in the hall calling out to one another, This is Marcia's birthday! Wish you many returns of the day! There was an excited running to and fro between the different rooms and gleeful exclamations, but no one came near her. She sat up in bed listening and wondering what it could mean. Why, Mother always came into her room and folded her to her heart and said those precious things that only a mother can say, and the children always scrambled to see who should be the first to give sister a birthday kiss. Were they playing some joke on her? She would be quiet and watch, and so not be taken unawares. Presently they went trooping happily downstairs into the dining room, and she heard Father's voice say, "'Good morning, children. I wish you many happy returns of Marcia's birthday.' What did it all mean? Was she going crazy? Or were they just trying to surprise her by some novel way of celebrating her birthday? She arose and with trembling fingers dressed herself hastily and stole softly down the stairs and looked into the dining room. Hush, father was asking a blessing. He returned thanks for dear Marcia's birthday and asked that it should be a happy day for them all. Beside each plate save her own were various packages, and these were opened amid ejaculations of surprise and pleasure and sundry hugs and kisses. After the first burst of happiness had subsided, Marcia braced herself and entered the dining room, saying with forced gaiety, "'Good morning, dear ones all.' They looked up with blank, unanswering faces and said, "'Good morning, Marcia.' That was all. But Marcia's heart leaped at the recognition of her presence, for she had begun to fear that she was dead and that it was her spirit that was wandering about. She stooped and kissed her mother, who murmured abstractedly, "'Yes, dear,' never once looking up from the presence she was examining. With a sinking heart she turned away from her mother and went and stood behind her father's chair, and leaning over whispered in his ear, "'Dear father, have you forgotten that this is my birthday?' He answered kindly but absent-mindedly, "'Why, daughter, am I likely to forget it with all these tokens around me?' And he waved his hand toward the gifts piled around his plate. This was almost more than Marcia could bear, for father was always specially tender and attentive to her on her birthday. She always sat on his knee a while, and he told her what a joy and comfort she was to him, and he always paid her some pretty compliment that made her girlish heart swell with innocent pride, for every girl knows that compliments from one's father are a little sweeter than any other's. In vain she hung around, waiting for some clue to this mysterious, unnatural conduct of the family. They were all absorbed in plans for spending this birthday, Marcia's birthday, but no reference whatever was made to what she liked. No one consulted her as to what she wanted to do or to have done. The boys were going skating in the forenoon. The little girls were to invite four of their friends to help serve the first dinner in the new doll's house, and in the afternoon father would take them all for an automobile ride into the country to a dear friend's all but Marcia, who couldn't bear to get into an auto since a terrible accident she had been in a few weeks ago. A troop of her girlfriends came in and in a conventional way wished her many happy returns of the day, and then proceeded to ignore her, and gave gifts to other members of the family. It is a wonder, thought Marcia bitterly, that they didn't have a birthday party for Marcia with Marcia left out. And so it went on all through that strange, miserable day. While they were all busy celebrating her birthday, she herself was neglected and ignored. As she sat in the quiet house alone in the twilight, for she had no heart to light the gas, just homesick for the personal love which had characterized all her birthdays and all her home life heretofore, there came a timid knock on the door, and as Marcia opened it, there stood little crippled Joe, one of her scholars in the Mission Sunday School. As he saw her, he gave a little exclamation of surprise and delight and said, "'Oh, Miss Marshy, I heard last night twas your birthday today, and I wanted to give you something white, like Mr. Robinson he told us about, don't you know?' and cause you're as all as treated me so white, and, and I didn't have nothin', and so I axed him, you know, what you tell us about in Sunday school, 
Jesus, who died on the cross, and who's allers willing to help a poor fella, and I asked him to help me get something real nice and white for your birthday, and I kept me eyes peeled all day expecting it, and just now a real swell feller bite a paper of me, and then he gave me this here bunch of white sweet smelling posies without my saying a word. Here they be, Miss Marshy, for your Jiminy teacher ain't them purty, and oh teacher, he made em in the fust place, and had the man give em to me, and so I reckon he and me's partners in this here white gift business and he held up in his thin, grimy hand a bunch of white, sweet-scented violets. Marcia's first impulse was to catch up the little fellow and his gift in her arms and baptize them with a flood of tears from her own overcharged heart. But she hadn't taught boys in a mission Sunday school class for nothing. Joe would have thought she had gone crazy, or been struck silly, or was sick unto death. So she controlled herself, and kneeling beside him took the violets reverently in both her hands, saying in a choked voice, "'Joe, they are just beautiful. This is the only really, truly white gift I have had today, and I don't deserve it, but I thank him and you." The boy looked at her with shining face, drew his hand across his eyes, and then answered brightly, "'Oh, that's all right, Miss Marshy. Tenny right tis with me, and I reckon tis with him.' And seizing his crutch, he hopped like a little sparrow through the door and onto the street, and she heard his boyish voice calling out, "'Evening papers, last edition, all about the big graft exposure." Just then the big white touring car discharged its merry load at the door, and the house was filled with the chatter and laughter of the children. In vain she tried to find a quiet corner where she could be alone with her heart. It was impossible to escape from the hilarious celebration of her birthday. She was so glad when the children said good night and went off to bed and she could seek the quiet of her own room. As she bade her father good night, he said, "'Well, daughter, I hope you have enjoyed your birthday and all your gifts.' At this, all the honesty of her nature, all the hatred of sham, rose up in one indignant outburst, and she exclaimed, "'I have had no gifts. Neither has this been my birthday celebration.' "'Why, Marcia," said her father in an aggrieved tone, "'this certainly is your birthday, and we have been very happy in keeping it for love of you.' "'I have failed to see any manifestation of love to me,' retorted Marcia. "'You may have had a happy time, but I have not been in it. You have given gifts to one another, but I have had just one,' and she held up the bunch of violets. This is a gift of love from little lame Joe in answer to his prayer and in pity for my hungry heart. There was silence in the room for a moment, and then her father answered, It seems to me, daughter, that when you get right down to a personal application, what you believe in after all is a white birthday. The words went through her like an electric shock, and with a start she awoke and sat upright in her chair, and lo, it was all a dream. Marcia looked around the room, shook herself a little, stirred the fire, and put on fresh coal. She laughed at the remembrance of her dream and its absurdity. How glad she was that it was only a dream! But was it only a dream? Was it not a reality? Was not this the way she had kept the Lord's birthday? When she had opened her Christmas treasure, how much had been given him and for love of him? How large a place had she given him in the season's activity? Had she ever made room for him as the central figure of it all? Or had he been crowded out? and his rightful place given to Santa Claus and the world's merrymaking. In the light of the Spirit she saw that the Star of Bethlehem always leads to the cross of Calvary. She had never liked to think about the cross before, but now it was all illumined with the glory of the love which gave to us God's best, His only begotten Son. She remembered how the Lord Jesus had said, If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. She saw that it is as we see Christ on the cross for us that we are drawn to Him. In that still hour, on her knees, at the foot of the cross, Marcia, with great gladness, made her first white gift unto her Lord. She gave herself to him. End of Her Birthday Dream by Nellie C. King Fireside Christmas Short Stories this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fireside Christmas Short Stories by Various Christmas with Jim's Friends Chapter 8 of Harbor Jim of Newfoundland by A. Eugene Bartlett Recording by David Wales there was the calendar right before me on the wall with figures big enough to mentally hit me and hit hard and i should have remembered that the road of the year had turned toward christmas but before me was an unfinished news article that even a hungry and insistent stomach did not seem able to push to a conclusion 
Beyond my desk, out of the window, I looked now and then down upon the hurrying throng who were making their way across City Hall Park to Brooklyn Bridge. It was the hour when you do not know whether to call it day or night. It was indescribable in another way. It was either misting or raining. I suppose a Scotchman would have called it mist and an Irishman rain. I think that anyone looking out that night would have found it hard to see in the grey view anything suggestive of Christmas. I turned from the wet view to my unfinished work only to be again interrupted. A Western Union boy burst into my office with a telegram. It was from St. John's, and I wondered, as I tore it open, if anything had happened to Harbor Jim. It was short, and for once the operators had apparently followed the author's spelling. Come for Christmas, can't take no for an answer. Know how biggest and best you or yourn have ever seed. Come, Jim. A few days afterward, a long letter came enforcing and elaborating the invitation. Jim wrote that he was already at work upon a Christmas that would eclipse anything New York had ever had. He had taken the idea out of a city paper that I had sent him a year before, and had developed it, and he wouldn't care to go forward with it unless I could be there. That is how it happened that a few days before Christmas, on the last steamer that would get me there in time, I was steaming into St. John's Harbor. Our boat was sheathed with ice, and as in the morning we came through the narrows, there were knobs of ice floating around us. The hills were white, and the brown stone now and then stuck through where the snow had lost its footing. Landing, I found the people in furs and the sleighs making merry music with their bells. A fellow agreed to drive me out to Jim's for two dollars and a half, and I went in his sleigh he called it, but in New England it would have more properly been called a pung. Jim almost literally wrapped me in his arms and outdid himself in the cordiality of his welcome. "'How's fishing, Jim?' I asked when the first greetings were over, and I had my feet up in front of the stove. "'Fishin'? Why, land a goshin', this ain't no time for fishin'. There ain't but one thing on my mind, and that is this Christmas.' Don't you see what we're a doin'? A kettle of oil was on the stove, and the dipping of half-grown candles had been recently finished. On the floor were half a hundred full-grown candles. Jim could talk only of Christmas. I've been thinking, he said, that if there should ever be a second coming of the Lord, or he should send another son to his people, he couldn't pick out a better time than this. Suppose it was to be another birth, I calculate this land has just as good a chance as Palestine, and hereabouts is as fit in a place as Bethlehem. Look out there at the snow. Makes you think of our baby's blankets, it's so white and clean and pretty. Our nights mayn't have stars as brilliant as that one greater star of the first Christmas morning, but I don't believe they have flying lights like ourn. I have noticed that the Lord tries to be as impartial as he can, and since he sent his son to the east last time, if ever he should send again, why, I think he'd be likely to send him somewhere hereabouts. You remember the son liked fishin', and he'd be delighted with Newfoundland. The door opened, and Bob McCartney walked in. "'What's the matter, Bob? What you got your good behavior on for?' asked Jim, as his friend entered. "'Ain't the occasion worth it? You said yourself that it was to be the biggest Christmas the Landers ever had, and I'd like to know if we aren't in a way celebrating now while we're getting ready.' "'Who's coming to this Christmas, Jim?' I asked, taking my turn at a question. "'Well, everybody in this town, quite a mess of folk from St. John's and Quiddy Viddy, some from Brigus, Killigrew, and Hart's Ease, Aunt Sary Bailey is a-comin' from Nancy Jobble, it's such a general invitation that there ain't no definite countin' no how, but they're comin'. Everybody that meets anybody hereabouts and nowadays just says, "Are you a comin' to Jim's for Christmas?" Gradually, by prying questions, I found out what Jim was planning to do. He had been extremely interested in the account I had sent him of the illuminated tree in Madison Square 
and had resolved to have the trees on a neighbouring hilltop all illuminated where they stood. In place of electric lights he was engaged in making tallow candles by hand. The day before Christmas Mrs. Jim was up very early, and when I came down to breakfast she greeted me with this. "'Got to make a biler full of tea this morning, for the decorating committee will be here shortly.' "'Yes,' added Jim. "'They'll be here shortly, and then we'll be a carrying out Christmas. Up your way they fetch it in, but we're a-going to carry it out, good and proper, this year.' The first arrival was Bob, who had caught the full contagion of Jim's spirit, and the second was Parson Curtis. "'Hello, Parson Curtis,' said Jim, as he ushered in his guest. "'Did you come to look on, or to work?' "'Put me in among the workers, Jim,' replied the parson. "'That's right, Parson,' Jim spoke with heartiness. "'I like a parson that ain't a mite afraid of work. I calculate that our Lord was one of the greatest workers this world ever seed, and it's a good thing for those who are a-taking his place to be up in the front row of workers. Here's a bag of candles, and here's a coil of wire. You can take em up the hill and begin hitchin' em to the tallest tree. You can begin on the low branches, and when the younger fellows get here, we'll let em shinny up to the taller branches.' By eight o'clock fifty men and boys were at work, many of them bringing their own donation of candles, and each time that Jim saw more candles coming he beamed, for it meant more trees could be included in the scheme. With banter, jest, and story the work of attaching the candles went on through the morning, and at noon we went back to Jim's for dinner. We all knew what to expect, and we were not disappointed, when, with keen appetites, we crowded the little house and waited our turn for a hot plate of brews. It's Newfoundland's distinctive dish, and salt fish and pork never tasted better than that noon after our climbing up in the trees. Walking back to finish our work in the afternoon, I said to Jim, it strikes me it is a little unfortunate that the hill we are decorating has no tall spruce on top. The trees are well arranged on the slopes, but the top of the hill itself hasn't a tree on it. That's what pleases me about it. That's why I selected it, because it leaves room for the candles of the Lord, answered Jim. There on the top is where the light of the world will shine out tonight. When we get the rest of the work done, we'll place it. An hour later, Jim came dragging a sled with a huge candle, four feet high at least, and it was carefully erected on the center of the open space on the hill. At three o'clock the work was finished, and Jim addressed the workers. "'Thank you all. We'll knock off for a spell. Those that lives near can go home. Those that lives too far will find plenty in my house. Be back, every one of you, an hour before sunset. The sun won't wait for any of ye, and if you don't get here, the lightin' will go on just the same. But I want you all to be here, sure. They began to arrive before the appointed time, but I waited within until it began to grow dark. Then I stepped to the door and watched the multitude coming up from the valley. I remember once I went out with the crowds and climbed Mount Rubidoux in California on an Easter morning. A little in advance of the larger contingent I stood and watched them coming up out of the darkness of the roads below into the glowing light of the mountain top and the new day. I thought of that experience again as I watched them coming along the road to climb the hill and keep Christmas Eve with Jim. Only in this instance the picture was reversed, and I saw them coming out of the light into the gathering darkness of the night. There were many from St. John's who had come out for the lark of it, men that worked along Water Street and Dock Street, girls from the stores came in little groups full of tickles and nudgings one another as things happened to meet their fancy. Women in black were in the crowd who had been before along a sorrowful way and turned to make this journey that they might find light. Some of them plainly showed by their demeanor that they were conscious of the fact that Christ was the best part of Christmas. Boys were in the throng, many of them swaggering along with sticks, copying the manner of English soldiers who feel their importance when on furlough. 
Little girls tripped along, some of them singing a little Christmas song that begins: "I saw three ships come sailing in On Christmas Day, on Christmas Day." The chatter of the many voices did not altogether drown their childish voices, and they rose like bird notes above the rushing winds of a forest. It was slippery walking, and now and then some one would fall, but a hand would be reached out to them, and they would again go on with a laugh. Everywhere was the glitter. That is what the Newfoundlanders call the spectacle of a snow and ice-girt earth. During the day many of our hands had been nearly frozen because of the ice on the trees, and they were festooned and sheathed with ice where their branches were a little out of the wind, and it had not stripped them of snow during the recent storm. It was a white, shining world, softened by a waning light. Now the fellows who had been appointed had been at work some time with torches, and as we looked up, tree after tree put on a garland of jewels and stood forth resplendent for the feast. Parson Curtis had lit the first torch from the candle of the Lord, as Jim called the big candle on the hilltop, and each torch had been lit from his. Murmurs ran through the crowd as the scene grew more beautiful with the lighting of more trees and the deepening of the night shadows. It was now quite dusky, but the snow kept the light so that we could see the workers finishing the lighting. When all was ready, standing beside the candle of the Lord, Jim spoke. "'Brothers in Christ, we all are that to-night. I am glad you have come to celebrate the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Parson Curtis will lead us in prayer. Jim knelt in the snow, and the great company followed his example. The prayer was short, and Jim was ready to announce the singing of the first of the Christmas hymns, when someone I didn't know made his way through the crowd, and, waiving all formalities, touched Jim on the arm, and spoke hurriedly. "'Rascal Moore's took sick. He's got a catch in his glutch, and the missus wants you to come over right now to sit up with him. She can't manage him, no how, and she sent for you." I was standing beside Jim, watching now his face and now the lights. I looked squarely at him now, and thought of the weeks of preparation that he had gone through, and how like some rare flower that blossoms only in the night it had unfolded petal by petal before his delighted eyes. I thought, too, of Rascal Moore, who had so long been living up to his name. It seemed unfair, indeed, to ask him to go now on this Christmas Eve that he had planned for and was making so successful. Let any one else go if they would, but surely not Jim. "'Tell him I'm on my way,' was all he said to the messenger, and he moved along as he spoke. Turning to me, he said what made me feel that he was still human, and without these words I think I must have doubted it. It would have been a little easier if it had a been Bob instead of Rascal. The program began, though Jim was leaving, and had turned his back on it all. Will Cunningham, whose tenor voice often led in the little church, started the Christmas hymn, Holy Night, Peaceful Night, and the crowd sang. The female voices seemed in preponderance, and I fancied the men all through the crowd were doing what the few around me were doing, heaping choice epithets upon Rascal Moore. Jim was yet to see more of his Christmas trees. He may have forgotten it, but his friends remembered that Rascal Moore's place was just about at the foot of the hill, and someone started taking off the candles from the trees that were a little beyond, and decorating those that were in the direct line toward the Moore house. There were so many hundreds, the work was speedily performed. The candles were relit, and by seven o'clock there was a row of lighted trees extending straight down the hill to the Moore house and at the top of the hill the big candle could now be distinctly seen against the black background of the night. It may be the angels are a little nearer on Christmas Eve, and they decided to add to the wonderful beauty of that night, for which Jim had worked and prayed. For now the northern lights came, adding great plumes of light flashing across the sky in a glory burst of light. "'It's the dead men playing, 
Come to earth they have for Christmas Eve," explained Bob. When all was ready, some one knocked at the Moor door and brought Jim to the porch, and he stood bareheaded looking up at the wonderful avenue of light to the top of the hill. Then he lifted his eyes from the earth lights and the black crowd to the sky. "'The heavens declare the glory of God,' Jim spoke quietly, but many could hear his words. "'Maybe little Peter is here to-night, playing in the heavens and joining us in our songs. The Lord of joy has come again.' "'What did you leave us for, Jim?' someone in the crowd shouted. The hundreds stood waiting for Jim's answer. It was a hush of expectancy, such as fitted that holy night. Jim answered slowly, measuring his words. I heard my father calling, and I went to answer him. End of Christmas with Jim's Friends Chapter 8 of Harbor Jim of Newfoundland by A. Eugene Bartlett Fireside Christmas Short Stories this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fireside Christmas Short Stories by Various Jimmy Scarecrow's Christmas by Mary E. Wilkins Freeman Recorded by Laura Armentrout Jimmy Scarecrow led a sad life in the winter. Jimmy's greatest grief was his lack of occupation. He liked to be useful, and in winter he was absolutely of no use at all. He wondered how many such miserable winters he would have to endure. He was a young Scarecrow, and this was his first one. He was strongly made and although his wooden joints creaked a little when the wind blew, he did not grow in the least rickety. Every morning when the wintry sun peered like a hard yellow eye across the dry corn stubble, Jimmy felt sad. But at Christmas time, his heart nearly broke. On Christmas Eve, Santa Claus came in his sledge, heaped high with presents, urging his team of reindeer across the field. He was on his way to the farmhouse where Betsy lived with her Aunt Hannah. Betsy was a very good little girl with very smooth yellow curls, and she had a great many presents. Santa Claus had a large wax doll baby for her on his arm, tucked up against the fur collar of his coat. He was afraid to trust it in the pack, lest it get broken. When poor Jimmy Scarecrow saw Santa Claus, his heart gave a great leap. Santa Claus, here I am, he cried out. But Santa Claus did not hear him. Santa Claus, please give me a little present. I was good all summer and kept the crows out of the corn, pleaded the poor scarecrow in his choking voice. But Santa Claus passed by with a merry hello and a great clamor of bells. Then Jimmy Scarecrow stood in the corn stubble and shook with sobs until his joints creaked. I am of no use in the world. And everybody has forgotten me, he moaned. But he was mistaken. The next morning, Betsy sat at the window, holding her Christmas doll baby, and she looked out at Jimmy Scarecrow standing alone in the field amidst the corn stubble. Aunt Hannah, said she. Aunt Hannah was making a crazy patchwork quilt and she frowned hard at a triangular piece of red silk and a circular piece of pink, wondering how to fit them together. Well, said she, 
Did Santa Claus bring the scarecrow any Christmas present? No, of course he didn't. Why not? Because he's a scarecrow. Don't ask silly questions. I wouldn't like to be treated so if I was a scarecrow, said Betsy. But her Aunt Hannah did not hear her. She was busy cutting a triangular snip out of the round piece of pink silk so the piece of red silk could be feather-stitched into it. It was snowing hard out of doors, and the north wind blew. The scarecrow's poor old coat got whiter and whiter with snow. Sometimes he almost vanished in the thick white storm. Aunt Hannah worked until the middle of the afternoon on her crazy quilt. Then she got up and spread it out over the sofa with an air of pride. There, said she, that's done, and that makes the eighth. I've got one for every bed in the house, and I've given four away. I'd give this away if I knew of anybody that wanted it. Aunt Hannah put on her hood and shawl and drew some blue yarn stockings on over her shoes and set out through the snow to carry a slice of plum pudding to her sister Susan, who lived down the road. Half an hour after Aunt Hannah had gone, Betsy put her little red plaid shawl over her head and ran across the field to Jimmy Scarecrow. She carried her new doll baby smuggled up under her shawl. Wish you Merry Christmas, she said to Jimmy Scarecrow. Wish you the same, said Jimmy, but his voice was choked with sobs and was also muffled for his old hat had slipped down to his chin. Betsy looked pitifully at the old hat fringed with icicles like frozen tears and the old snow-laden coat. I've brought you a Christmas present, said she, and with that she tucked her doll baby inside Jimmy Scarecrow's coat, sticking its tiny feet into a pocket. Thank you, said Jimmy Scarecrow faintly. You're welcome, said she. Keep her under your overcoat so the snow won't wet her and she won't catch cold. She's delicate. Yes, I will, said Jimmy Scarecrow, and he tried hard to bring one of his stiff, outstretched arms around to clasp the doll baby. Don't you feel cold in that old summer coat? asked Betsy. If I had a little exercise, I should be warm, he replied. But he shivered, and the wind whistled through his rags. You wait a minute, said Betsy, and was off across the field. Jimmy Scarecrow stood in the corn stubble with the doll baby under his coat and waited, and soon Betsy was back again, with Aunt Hannah's crazy quilt trailing in the snow behind her. Here, said she, here is something to keep you warm and she folded the crazy quilt around the scarecrow and pinned it. Aunt Hannah wants to give it away if anybody wants it, she explained. She's got so many crazy quilts in the house now, she doesn't know what to do with them. Goodbye! Be sure you keep the doll baby covered up! And with that she ran across the field and left Jimmy Scarecrow alone with the crazy quilt and the doll baby. The bright flash of colors under Jimmy's hat brim dazzled his eyes, and he felt a little alarmed. I hope this quilt is harmless, if it is crazy, he said. But the quilt was warm, and he dismissed his fears. Soon, the doll baby whimpered, but he creaked his joints a little, and that amused it, and he heard it cooing inside his coat. Jimmy Scarecrow had never felt so happy in his life as he did for an hour or so. But after that, the snow began to turn to rain, 
and the crazy quilt was soaked through and through. And not only that, but his coat and the poor doll baby. It cried pitifully for a while, and then it was still, and he was afraid it was dead. It grew very dark, and the rain fell in sheets. The snow melted, and Jimmy Scarecrow stood halfway up his old boots in water. He was saying to himself that the saddest hour of his life had come, when suddenly he again heard Santa Claus's sleigh bells and his merry voice talking to his reindeer. It was after midnight. Christmas was over, and Santa was hastening home to the North Pole. Santa Claus! Dear Santa Claus! cried Jimmy Scarecrow with a great sob. And that time Santa Claus heard him and drew rein. Who's there? he shouted out of the darkness. It's only me, replied the Scarecrow. Who's me? shouted Santa Claus. Jimmy Scarecrow. Santa got out of his sledge and waded up. Have you been standing here ever since corn was ripe? he asked pityingly. And Jimmy replied that he had. What's that over your shoulders? Santa Claus continued holding up his lantern. It's a crazy quilt. And what are you holding under your coat? The doll baby that Betsy gave me, and I'm afraid it's dead. Poor Jimmy Scarecrow sobbed. Nonsense, cried Santa Claus. Let me see it. And with that he pulled the doll baby out from under the Scarecrow's coat and patted its back and shook it a little and it began to cry, and then to crow. It's all right, said Santa Claus. This is the doll baby I gave Betsy, and it is not at all delicate. It went through the measles, and the chicken pox, and the mumps, and the whooping cough before it left the North Pole. Now get into the sledge, Jimmy Scarecrow, and bring the doll baby and the crazy quilt. I've never had any quilts that weren't in their right minds at the North Pole, but maybe I can cure this one. Get in! Santa chirruped to his reindeer, and they drew the sledge up close in a beautiful curve. Get in, Jimmy Scarecrow, and come with me to the North Pole, he cried. Please, how long shall I stay? asked Jimmy Scarecrow. Why, you're going to live with me, replied Santa Claus. I've been looking for a person like you for a long time. Are there any crows to scare away at the North Pole? I want to be useful, Jimmy Scarecrow said anxiously. No, answered Santa Claus, but I don't want you to scare away crows. I want you to scare away Arctic explorers. I can keep you in work for a thousand years, and scaring away Arctic explorers from the North Pole is much more important than scaring away crows from corn. Why, if they found the pole, there wouldn't be a piece an inch long left in a week's time, and the earth would cave in like an apple without a core. They would whittle it all to pieces and carry it away in their pockets for souvenirs. Come along. I am in a hurry. I will go on two conditions, said Jimmy. First, I want to make a present to Aunt Hannah and Betsy next Christmas. You shall make them any present you choose. What else? I want some way provided to scare the crows out of the corn next summer while I am away, said Jimmy. That is easily managed, said Santa Claus. Just wait a minute. 
Santa took his stylographic pen out of his pocket, went with his lantern close to one of the fence posts, and wrote these words upon it. Notice to Crows Whichever crow shall hereafter hop, fly, or flop into this field during the absence of Jimmy Scarecrow, and therefrom purloin, steal, or abstract corn, shall be instantly, in a twinkling and a trice, turned snow white, and be ever after a disgrace a byword and a reproach to his whole race per order of santa claus the corn will be safe now said santa claus get in jimmy got into the sledge and they flew away over the fields out of sight with merry halloos and a great clamor of bells the next morning there was much surprise at the farmhouse when Aunt Hannah and Betsy looked out of the window, and the scarecrow was not in the field, holding out his stiff arms over the corn stubble. Betsy had told Aunt Hannah she had given away the crazy quilt and the doll baby, but had been scolded very little. You must not give away anything of yours again without asking permission, said Aunt Hannah. And you have no right to give anything of mine even if you know I don't want it. Now both my pretty quilt and your beautiful doll baby are spoiled. That was all Aunt Hannah had said. She thought she would send John after the quilt and the doll baby next morning, as soon as it was light. But Jimmy Scarecrow was gone, and the crazy quilt and the doll baby with him. John, the servant man, searched everywhere, but not a trace of them could he find. They must have all blown away, Mum, he said to Aunt Hannah. We shall have to have another scarecrow next summer, said she. But the next summer there was no need of a scarecrow, for not a crow came past the fence post on which Santa Claus had written his notice to crows. The cornfield was never so beautiful, and not a single grain was stolen by a crow, and everybody wondered at it, for they could not read the crow language in which Santa had written. It is a great mystery to me why the crows don't come into our cornfield when there is no scarecrow, said Aunt Hannah. But she had a still greater mystery to solve when Christmas came round again. Then she and Betsy had each a strange present. They found them in the sitting room on Christmas morning. Aunt Hannah's present was her old crazy quilt, remodeled, with every piece cut square and true, and matched exactly to its neighbor. Why, it's my old crazy quilt! But it isn't crazy now, cried Aunt Hannah, and her very spectacles seemed to glisten with amazement. Betsy's present was her doll baby of the Christmas before. But the doll was a year older. She had grown an inch and could walk and say, Mama, and How do? She was changed a good deal, but Betsy knew her at once. It's my doll baby, she cried, and snatched her up and kissed her. But neither Aunt Hannah nor Betsy ever knew that the quilt and the doll were Jimmy Scarecrow's Christmas presents to them. End of Jimmy Scarecrow's Christmas by Mary E. Wilkins Freeman Fireside Christmas Short Stories This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fireside Christmas Short Stories by Various The Snowman by Alfred B. Cooper I've double reason, good and bad, for remembering the Christmas of 1890-something, because, while it was the most humiliating day of my life, it ended my career as a swell cracksman, and was the commencement of my better days. I'd long had my eye on Wharton Manor as a crib worth the cracking, and, as I never was the mere midnight marauder who is popularly supposed to lurk under the bed until the family is asleep, I thought the dinner hour on Christmas Eve a favourable opportunity for taking my pick of the jewel cases of Lord Wharton's guests, and for annexing the unconsidered trifles that doubtless strewed their dressing tables. I did not forget that some of the most valuable articles would at that moment be enhancing the charms of their fair owners, but, as I always worked single-handed and could not hope to carry away a van load, I reckoned upon picking up sufficient to pay me handsomely for my trouble. Audacity is half the battle in artistic burglary. I always trusted to my wits, and, I will say this for myself, I never carried a weapon of any kind. I took the fortunes of war, and considered that, if I were dolt enough to walk into a trap, or let another man's wits outwit mine, or another man's legs outrun mine, I ought to yield him the palm like a gentleman. And it was the fact that things panned out so differently from anything I could have foreseen. But that's the end of the story, and we are still at the beginning. Christmas, 1890-something, was the snowiest in my memory. It was a real Christmas card Christmas, and as I stood in the deep shadow of a yew within forty yards of the manor, the scene pleased my artistic eye not a little. The great hall door was wide open in spite of the severity of the weather, for it was a still night, and a flood of rosy light from the crimson-covered lamps and fairy lights streamed out upon the drive. Low lights, too, burned in most of the upper windows, but as the whole house party was at dinner they revealed no sign of life within. The drive swept round to my right as I faced the house. Having studied the geography of the neighbourhood, I knew where it was, certainly, or I should have had difficulty in locating it. A line of yew trees, similar to the one behind which I stood, was planted at intervals along the near edge of the drive, and the opposite side was bounded by a broad stone balustrade, something like the parapet of Waterloo Bridge, though not nearly so high. This stone fence was a beautiful ornament to the manor, and was admired by everybody, but, strangely enough, it was for use even more than ornament. The manor stood high, and the ground to the right fell away very suddenly into a deep dingle. This dingle was full of bracken and brambles, which filled the spaces between the young trees, but the rock cropped out here and there, and made it a dangerous place on a dark night. That was the reason of the stone balustrade. Farther down the drive the ravine shallowed off, and winding paths went in and out, which made it a very jolly place in the summer. When first I took my position of observation behind the yew, I got a fright. Casting my eyes towards the balustrade, I saw what I thought was a man looking directly at me. It was the hat that made the figure appear so real, yet I could have laughed aloud at my fears the next minute. It was a man indeed, but it was a man of snow, built on the coping of the balustrade in imitation of a statue. The house was full of young fellows and girls, with a fair sprinkling of small boys. Lord Wharton had no fewer than six of his own, and they had spent the morning, all the lot of them, setting up this effigy just for the fun of the thing. This figure could not be seen from the front door, because the sweep of the drive brought the ewes into the line of sight. From where I stood, however, I could have knocked his old silk hat off with a snowball, and, such are the mad impulses of our poor human nature, I could have found it in my heart almost to have had a shy. Of course, I did no such thing, 
for i could see by the dishes the flunkies were carrying in that dinner was getting on and that i was much later at my post than i had intended to be i must bestir myself if i meant business business yes it was my business then i am sorry to say and no easy business either yet i knew exactly what i was going to attempt and how i meant to attempt it there was nothing original in the plan ivy and an open window summed it up the back of the house would doubtless have been safer but then my booty was in front and at such an hour it would have been ten times more risky to traverse the house from back to front than to go boldly in at an upper front window behold me then ten minutes later stealthily peering into a dimly lighted room most luxuriously furnished i had experienced more difficulty than usual for i was as nimble as a cat in negotiating the ivy because i wore a long lightish coloured overcoat made necessary by my tendency to rheumatism only a couple of candles in candlesticks of beaten silver served to light the room but i could see the gleam of jewels and rich ornaments on the dressing-table half hidden by a heavy curtain which hung from a sort of carved oaken bracket branching from the wall i stepped inside upon the thick pile of the carpet and stole noiselessly towards the glittering table the next moment you might have knocked me down with a feather behind the curtain quickly pocketing the smallest and most valuable objects he could see was a man in evening dress a big man half as big again as myself but with gentleman's valley written all over him we were not four feet apart and the gasp of astonishment i gave was enough to make him nearly jump out of his skin his dismay was only momentary he knew the next instant what i was there for and was evidently as quick-witted as i for before i could say peas he had darted between the wall and the curtain banged the window into its place and yelled thieves 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 a truer plural than any one imagined at the very top of his voice for the wink of an eyelid i meant to tackle him but what was the use moments were mighty precious just then and even while he was shouting the sly wretch i turned and bolted for the door intending to make a dash through the camp of the enemy and trust to my heels to get clear away as bad luck would have it as i turned the bend of the stairs that brought me in full view of the brilliantly lighted hall i ran full tilt against a big flunky with a tray of wine glasses talk about a shindy a gas explosion would scarcely have made more noise broken glass clattering tray and the bumpety bump of two heavy bodies falling downstairs was something to remember i fell uppermost and giving myself a bounce up with a prod below the belt which knocked the remaining wind out of the footman i made for the door again as if a legion had been behind me nor was it mere fancy for in truth a legion was behind me the valet's big voice must have penetrated to the dining-room and the tremendous clatter of the footman and my luckless self caused by the downfall brought the party out like a swarm of bees thieves came like a thunderclap from the top of the stairs the valet was playing the game to perfection i had thirty yards start but i knew that among the guests would be many a young athlete from the varsities men who could do their hundred in even time soccer and rugger men who were accustomed to rough and tumble so my chances of getting clear away were none too rosy besides the whole party were lighter shod and clad than i and i knew that these young fellows though in no rig for snow would not care a straw about ruining their dress shoes i got round the sweep of the drive and was in the straight it was three hundred yards to the great gate and cover except the yews was scarce a gleam of lanterns ahead decided me my way was blocked meanwhile my wits had been working at express speed it was snowing again in heavy flakes i purposely fell headlong into the snow piled on the edge of the drive rolled over and over and clutched an armful of it to my body and shoulders i then scrambled up 
leapt upon the stone balustrade snatched the old silk hat all snow covered from the head of the snowman gave that unfortunate effigy a shove which toppled it neck and crop into the depths of the dingle and myself dropped upon my knees on the top of the snowy foundation it had left behind it it was the work of five seconds at the most and there was i with the snow-crowned hat over my eyes my overcoat thickly caked with snow and my legs wholly invisible posing in the room and stead of the man of snow the hue and cry went past me like a whirlwind half a dozen flunkies in their knee breeches and yellow stockings bringing up the rear they ran full speed thirty yards past my post of observation into a band of weights with lanterns and instruments from the village these yokels were ready to turn and fly themselves when they saw the strange exodus from the manor thinking no doubt that all the ghosts of which the old house was well known to be the trysting place had suddenly appeared not in singles but in battalions and scared the guests away from their dinner and out of their five senses but the sudden halt didn't help me in the least the dilemma was distinctly mutual and i did not bless the weights one little bit had the thief gone down the drive they would surely have seen him it was a perfect mystery how he could possibly have dodged them he had been seen in full flight round the bend he must either have gone over into the dingle a most unlikely course if he knew what he was doing or he was hiding behind the yews then commenced a game of hide and seek i nearly burst with laughter as i saw this mixed company dodge in and out among the sombre trees and catch at each other convulsively each thinking the other a burglar but there was no opportune opening for me all i could do was to kneel stock still one of the weights pointed me out his attitude showed terror though i could not see his face the laugh that greeted his find sent him behind a yew tree on a fresh trail and very greatly reassured me i evidently looked my part just then there was another arrival the local policeman and a big man in plain clothes whom i guessed was a tech lord wharton and some of the guests were in a group near me when they came along and i heard the whole colloquy their arrival at that moment was quite unconnected with my affair but it seemed to fit into the circumstances as detailed by his lordship in a few sentences i heard the tech say he's a very old hand known commonly as toff smith but his real name is charles markland he's wanted for a dozen big jobs and i've had almost certain advice that he's somewhere in this neighbourhood it'll be he said his lordship but he has been balked this time lieutenant fontenoy's valet was too quick for him he has got away in the most amazing fashion but it's a comfort to know that he has gone empty-handed i'd heard of toff smith he was one of the bigwigs of the profession a perfect napoleon of burglary but it goes without saying i was not he so i was now not only personating a snowman but involuntarily standing in the shoes of toff smith as well he's got clear away one cried why trouble further james tells me he did not have time to pick up a pin let us have a lark while we're out i guessed it was lieutenant fontenoy who spoke and all the youngsters who had enjoyed the whole thing immensely set up a shout for he had evidently suggested something cockshies pay your penny and take your chance now then fair and square no don't cross the drive who will knock his hat off first take your choice coconut or cigar i'm frozen to death it'll warm us up these were the cries i heard but i didn't at the first blush tumble to their meaning the ladies clad in thick wraps were at the windows all this time where they could look along the drive and get news of the search now i heard them laugh merrily as a small boy ran across and made some communication to them i quickly learned what it was they were to witness a bombardment the whole band guests and waits the police had hurried off 
were gathered together about twenty yards from where i knelt and at the word of command they let fly i have enjoyed snowballing in my time but that was when i had a chance of potting my opponent in the nape of the neck when he was stooping for ammunition but to be the sole target for thirty well-directed missiles per second is another story move i dared not i must grin and bear it or failing that bear it without grinning i had jammed the beastly old hat too tightly over my cranium for it to be easily dislodged and the fun in consequence waxed fast and furious by degrees discipline broke down and the set distance was no longer regarded snowballs innumerable came at me from a range of a few yards with terrific force recognition was quickly put out of the question for had i been a veritable snowman i could not have looked more like one every snowball that hit and few indeed missed left its contribution to my make-up and i was shortly in peril of suffocation from the accumulation of snow about my mouth and nostrils and almost equally in danger of temporary blindness but that the hat rim protected me enough at least to keep half an eye intact had not the top of the wall been broad and i on my knees i must inevitably have gone over willy-nilly but hitherto i had kept my place and i meant to continue to do so for the fall backwards had greater terrors for me even than remaining where i was but now the clapping of fair hands the exhilarating exercise the excitement of the last twenty minutes and the spirit of mad revel which enters into the hearts of all men occasionally wrought my doom the weights as aforementioned had been pressed into the fray it was christmas time and class distinctions went by the board even the man who played the big bass viol had propped his instrument against a tree and joined in the sport but now like me they were to be sorry they had come half a dozen young sparks to vary the amusement seized the big bass fiddle and the youngsters fought for clarinet hope boy ovi clyde euphonium and trombone then to the sound of a wild unearthly pibroch they levelled the bass fiddle like a battering ram and charged for the supposed snowman with shouts of laughter thinking to demolish it finally and end the sport i saw it coming and i knew that the bottom end of a bass fiddle has an ugly spike which might put an end to my career more surely than the dingle i never waited for the shock i went down without a touch and rolling over and over down the steep bank i only remember thinking i should never stop and then nothing how i got to everledge a small town five miles away i never rightly knew i came to myself in the dingle while it was still dark with pains in every limb the nurse at the cottage hospital bless her tells me that i was picked up in an apparently dying state and everybody sympathized with my being lost in the snow i never told her the truth how could i when she was so kind and good but if she had guessed why i was so interested in the district weekly paper she might have suspected something here is the conclusion of the paragraph which took my eye this is one of the most cunning robberies on record the detectives think the whole affair was a put-up job on the part of toff smith lieutenant fontenoy's valet who left a most impudent note behind him for while the party were all disporting themselves with the snowman or applauding from the windows he got clear away with three thousand pounds worth of jewellery end of the snowman by alfred b cooper Fireside Christmas Short Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fireside Christmas Short Stories by Various. The Shepherd Who Didn't Go by J. T. Stocking. You have all heard of the shepherds who went to Bethlehem, but I do not believe any of you have heard of the shepherd who didn't go. The Bible does not say anything about him, but his story has come to me and I am going to tell it to you. 
The city of Bethlehem stood on a hill. Below the town, with its steep, narrow streets and white walls, were gray olive orchards. Below the orchards were gardens bright with flowers. Below the gardens lay green meadows, and beyond these pasture lands that stretched away to the wilderness plains where little patches of grass grew among the bushes and between the great rocks. There were caves among these rocks where wolves used to skulk and sometimes robbers hid. So the shepherds who guarded their flocks in these wild pastures dared not leave them alone. One clear, beautiful night, many centuries ago, four shepherds were watching their flocks on these pastures. Samuel, Ezra, Joel, and David were their names. Samuel, Ezra, and Joel were strong men, no longer young, with shaggy eyebrows and brown beards. Ezra's was short, Joel's long, and Samuel's streaked with gray. They owned the flocks which they tended. David was a boy, with ruddy cheeks, bright eyes, and strong, lithe limbs. He cared for the flocks of old Abraham. Abraham was old and rich and did not work any more, but hired David, whose family was very poor, to care for his sheep. The flocks of the four shepherds were lying quiet on the plains far below the city, and nearby Samuel, Ezra, Joel, and David lay wrapped in their shepherd's cloaks. Samuel, said David, rising upon his elbow. What is it, David? asked the other in a deep voice. Are you not glad that you tend sheep in Bethlehem instead of some distant place? Why, David? asked Samuel sleepily. "'Because it is in Bethlehem that the king we have been looking for so long is to be born. I have been reading it in the prophets only to-day.' "'Have you only just heard of that?' asked Ezra sourly. "'No,' replied the boy hotly. "'I have heard my mother tell of it ever since I can remember, and I have read it over and over again. Samuel?' "'Yes, David.' "'Do you think we shall ever see the promised king?' "'I do not know, my boy,' the older man answered sadly. "'We have waited long, and there seems little hope for Israel now.' But he will come some day. He will come some day. Why do you ask, David? I cannot tell. That is often in my mind. Something makes me think of it tonight. Perhaps it is because I read of him today. Samuel, I would walk to the end of the earth to see the Christ child. Well, you need not start now, grumbled Ezra, and Joel added roughly, Go to sleep, boy, the hour is late. It was much later before David fell asleep, for his head was full of dreams and the stories of wonderful days to come that his mother had told him but at length he joined the rest in healthy slumber. Suddenly it seemed to each of them that something had passed over him and touched him lightly on the cheek. The older men raised themselves on their elbows, but David sprang to his feet. At first they saw only a great light which nearly blinded them, then they discerned a shining form in the sky and heard a voice say, Be not afraid, for behold I bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all the people, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Saviour who is Christ the Lord, and this is the sign unto you. Ye shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And then all the sky was full of light, and the air was full of heavenly voices singing, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. While the shepherds listened, half joyful, half afraid, the light faded, and the voices floated away, Good will to men, to men, to men. And all was still as before. For a moment the shepherds looked at each other in silent awe and wonder. Then Ezra spoke in a voice dry with fear. What was it? David stood speechless, and Samuel answered reverently, Angels. Brothers, he continued, a wonderful thing has happened to us. It has been a long, long day since angels have spoken to men. Then he girded his shepherd's cloak about him and seized his staff. Come, Ezra, Joel, David, let us be going. Going where? asked Ezra and Joel. Why, to Bethlehem, to see the child. Did not the angel tell us the sign? Let us go at once to find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. There be many mangers in Bethlehem, objected Ezra. I know not how we shall find him, said Joel. It is a vain search, I fear. And he drew his cloak about him and reached for his staff. But I will go with you if you say. So they started, Samuel, Ezra, and Joel. But David stood still. Come, David, make haste, called Samuel. But the boy did not move. I cannot go, he said. "'Cannot go?' cried Samuel in amazement, and Ezra added, "'Who said but a little while ago that he would go to the end of the earth to see the king?' "'And so I would,' cried David. "'But the sheep, we cannot leave the sheep alone.' "'The sheep will be safe enough,' said Samuel. "'The dogs will keep them together. There are no wolves tonight. Come, David.' But the boy was firm. "'There is my master. He'll be angry if I leave his flocks alone.' "'Old Abraham will never know,' said Joel. "'Abraham is a hard master,' said David. Many a time I have felt his heavy staff on my back, but it is not that which keeps me. I have given my word that, come day, come night, come life, come death, I will not fail to keep the flocks. 
Go on without me. I must keep my word. Go on. So they went on, impatient and eager for this wondrous quest, Ezra and Joel muttering now and then at the obstinacy of the boy, but Samuel full of glowing admiration. David watched them as they moved up the hill. That dream of finding the Christ child, how could he give it up? Once he started forward, I will go! But something held him back, and he threw himself upon the ground and kept back tears of bitter disappointment. After a time he grew calmer, and found a certain comfort in thinking of the helplessness of his flock. Suddenly the low growling of his dog brought him to his feet, but he saw nothing, heard nothing, and bade the dog be still. In a moment, with a bark of alarm, the dog was up again and away. David sprang up, certain now that danger was near. There was panic in the flock. Toward the wilderness he could see lean gray forms moving stealthily and swiftly among the sheep. Wolves! Springing upon a rock and waving his cloak in circles about his head, he uttered the familiar call which gathered the sheep about him, his own sheep nearest, and behind them the flocks of Samuel, Ezra, and Joel. The wolves made off, and David quickly looked over his flock to see if all were there, for the eastern shepherd knows his sheep by name. One by one he named them, with an increasing feeling of relief. They were all there, no, one was missing. Kebarbara, the pet of the flock. Kebarbara means striped, and the little sheep was so called because of the dark marking of her fleece. After waving his staff over the huddled beasts, and uttering a few times the soothing cry, Hoo-ta! Hoo-ta! He rushed off in the direction which the wolves had taken. At the top of the steep bank, at the edge of the pasture, he stopped and called, Kebarbara! Kebarbara! and for an answer heard an anguished bleat from the rocks below. It was a steep and slippery way, but David plunged down with no thought of anything but the sheep. Loose stones gave way and he lost his footing. At the bottom he picked himself up unhurt, and there beside him were two wolves quarreling over the wounded sheep. One of them slunk away at sight of the boy, but the other had a taste of blood and sprang at David, missing his throat but sinking his teeth into his leg. Then David, as the beast turned to spring again, struck him a heavy blow on the head with his staff and killed him. His own wounds were bleeding and painful, but he turned at once with caressing words to the sheep. Kebarbara, they have hurt you, little sheep, but they have not killed you. I reached you just in time. You cannot walk, can you? And I am afraid I cannot carry you. But I can help. There, put your head on my arm. He groaned with pain. No, the other one. So he talked to her as to a child, as the wounded boy and the wounded sheep slowly made their way up the steep hillside and over the rough rocks. It was not a long way, and half an hour before the sturdy shepherd lad would have bounded over it quickly enough. But now the wounded leg was slow, the wounded arm was weak, and the wounded lamb seemed very heavy. It was a weary journey, with many stops. When at last they reached the flock, still huddled trembling together, David had only strength to give one reassuring, Ooh, ta, then fell exhausted. How long he lay there he did not know, but the dawn was growing bright when three men appeared from the direction of the town. It was not the shepherds, but old Abraham and two of his servants. As the old man caught sight of his flock, but he saw no shepherd, he raged with anger. David! he shouted fiercely. David! There was no answer. The young vagabond, he has left the sheep. Of great worth are his promises. He would keep my flock. Come life, come death. David! Let me once find him, and I will give him something he will remember longer than he does his vows. As he drew near the flock, he discovered the boy lying on the ground. Ah, sleep is he, and the sun this high. Come, get up! He shouted fiercely and lifted his staff to strike. But as he did so, he caught sight of the white face and the bleeding arm and noticed the wounded sheep. Old Abraham dropped his angry arm, and there was a touch of tenderness that was strange to him as he continued, Ah, David, boy, you did not forget your promises, did you, David? And I would have struck you. Forgive me, my lad. Then turning to his servants, he gave them command. Take him to the inn and bid them care for him. I myself will keep the flock today. The servants bowed low. The inn is full, my lord. Old Abraham commanded again positively. Take him to the inn, I say. But the inn is full, my lord, replied the older servant, trembling. Then the other servant spoke. There is perhaps room in the stable, my lord. Then bear him thither and bid them give him the best of care. Go at once. So the servants bore David away, still unconscious from his wounds, and made him comfortable on a bed of straw in the stable of the inn. It was some hours before he came to himself. When at last he opened his eyes and his ears began to catch once more the sounds about him, the first thing he heard was a faint cry. "'What is that?' he asked eagerly of Samuel, who was watching beside him. "'That,' said the old shepherd in tones of mingled joy and reverence, "'is the child the angels told us about, the child we came to see. We found him here in the stable, in a manger.' "'And am I not to see him?' "'Yes, you are,' said Samuel and a grave-faced man brought the child and laid him in David's arms. 
the child for whose coming the people had been longing for a thousand years. The color at length came back to David's white cheeks and strength and health to his limbs, and he went back again to the plain. Old Abraham embraced him. "'Forgive me, my son. I have been a hard master. Thou hast been very faithful, and for thy reward I make thee lord over all my flocks, and half of them shall be thine own.' So David became a man of flocks, and all his days he was known among the other shepherds as the one who had held the Christ child in his arms. And there was none among them who was thought so brave and gentle and wise as the shepherd who didn't go. End of The Shepherd Who Didn't Go by J. T. Stocking Recording by Angela Fireside Christmas Short Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Fireside Christmas Short Stories by Various Grandmother's Christmas Story by Faith Wynne Henrietta and Roland and Frank were spending the holidays at Grandmother's, and among the many gifts for the children there was a book full of pictures for Henrietta, and her brown head was bent over it very earnestly for at least ten minutes, and she exclaimed, "'Bringing in the Yule Log! What does that mean, Grandmother?' And Grandmother replied, it was an ancient English custom to have a log cut from the largest tree in the park on the last day of the Christmas holidays, and on the following Christmas Eve it was dragged in and placed upon the immense dogs on either side of the wide hearth. Those who dragged it in sang the while a carol, commencing, Come bring with a noise, my merry merry boys, the Christmas log to the firing. It was then kindled with a brand from last year's Christmas fire that had been kept for the purpose, and with the light of this huge yule log the great hall or dining apartment would be in a rich warm glow. "'How perfectly lovely!' cried the impulsive Roland, springing upon Grandmother's lap and giving her a quick little hug, while Henrietta and Frank drew near with eager faces. "'Please tell us more!' "'Can't you tell us a story?' said Henrietta. "'Either about Christmas or New Year's.' "'And let it begin when I was a little girl,' said Roland. "'That's just like Roland,' said Frank. "'He would always rather a story should commence when I was a little girl, or boy, than once upon a time. "'Well, suppose I commence once upon a time when I was a little girl.' said Grandmother, smiling at the three satisfied nods. Once upon a time when I was a little girl, I spent the holidays with my parents in England, visiting some dear friends. The little daughter Elsie was about my own age, and she had two little cousins visiting her, one from Germany named Gretchen, and one from France named Adele. On Christmas Eve we fell into quite a dispute. Elsie and I were quite sure Santa Claus, with his sleigh and reindeer, would soon be prancing over the roof, whose peaks, I feared, would prevent his reaching the chimney in safety, when Gretchen said, St. Nicholas was the one who brought gifts, and he rode upon a white horse, carrying a basket on one arm, filled with toys for the good children and holding in his hand a bundle of switches for the naughty disobedient ones. "'Our presents,' said Adele, "'are generally brought on New Year's Eve instead of Christmas by a young maiden dressed in white, with long white hair flowing over her shoulders, and a gold crown upon her head set round with burning tapers. In one hand she holds a silver bell, and in the other a basket of sweetmeats.' We decided finally that we must not quarrel for fear the bundle of switches might be left for us, and so Elsie, Adele and I hung up our stockings, and Gretchen knelt before the wide fireplace and held out her little apron, begging St. Nick to let fall a pretty gift, and then she polished her little shoes and filled them with oats for St. Nick's white horse and set them in the fireplace. While we were thus engaged, we heard the blowing of a horn. 
Hark, said Elsie, there are the mummers. She ran to the window, and we followed, wondering and a little frightened, but we only saw in the moonlight six human figures, dressed grotesquely, who, Elsie told us, went from house to house on Christmas Eve, and were ever admitted, giving a rude kind of dramatic performance. Elsie's father invited them in, and gave the best that his hospitable board afforded, as was the custom of the times. "'Were the oats all gone from Gretchen's shoes?' interrupted Roland, whose mind had been dwelling more upon this part of the story than upon the mummers. "'Yes. When the Christmas bells rang out their silvery chimes on Christmas morning, we jumped up and ran downstairs to find the little shoes filled with toys and sweetmeats, and our stockings were so full as to have lost the shape of stockings.' after breakfast we were invited into a room wreathed in evergreen smelling sweet and fresh and wholesome where a beautiful christmas tree met our astonished eyes it had all been arranged so quietly that we knew nothing of it after breakfast the good mistress of the house sent out generous rations of beef and bread to the poor and asked each of us to share our gifts with less favoured children that we too might know the blessedness of giving as well as receiving. I wonder if you know, my dears, that our Christmas tree originated in Germany, and our Christmas stocking in Belgium, while the Merry Christmas and Happy New Year is the old English greeting shouted from window to street and street to window. It is a beautiful custom wherever originated, of laying down old animosities with the old year and beginning the new year with good will to all men and when the bells ring out the old year and ring in the new grandmother hopes her children will correct their little faults and ask the good father to help you to overcome them before they become so strong that they will overcome you and now as you have had a merry merry christmas may you have a happy new year end of grandmother's christmas story by faith wynne recording by ruth golding fireside christmas short stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fireside Christmas Short Stories by Various A Visit from St. Nicholas by Clement C. Moore Recording by Lynn Thompson Twas the night before Christmas when all through the house Not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse the stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that st nicholas soon would be there the children were nestled all snug in their beds while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads and mamma in her kerchief and i in my cap had just settled our brains for a long winter's nap when out on the lawn there arose such a clatter i sprang from the bed to see what was the matter away to the window i flew like a flash tore open the shutters and threw up the sash the moon on the breast of the new-fallen snow gave the lustre of midday to objects below when what to my wondering eye should appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer with a little old driver so lively and quick i knew in a moment it must be saint nick more rapid than eagles his coursers they came and he whistled and shouted and called them by name now dasher now dancer now prancer and vixen on comet on cupid on donder and blitzen to the top of the porch to the top of the wall now dash away dash away dash away all as dry leaves that before the wild hurricane fly when they meet with an obstacle mount to the sky so up to the housetop the coursers they flew with a sleigh full of toys and st nicholas too and then in a twinkling i heard on the roof 
the prancing and pawing of each little hoof as i drew in my head and was turning around down the chimney st nicholas came with a bound he was dressed all in fur from head to his foot and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot a bundle of toys he had flung on his back and he looked like a peddler just opening his pack his eyes how they twinkled his dimples how merry his cheeks were like roses his nose like a cherry his droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow and the beard of his chin was as white as the snow the stump of a pipe he held tight in his teeth and the smoke it encircled his head like a wreath he had a broad face and a little round belly that shook when he laughed like a bowlful of jelly he was chubby and plump a right jolly old elf and i laughed when i saw him in spite of myself a wink of his eye and a twist of his head soon gave me to know i had nothing to dread he spoke not a word but went straight to his work and filled all the stockings then turned with a jerk and laying his finger aside of his nose and giving a nod up the chimney he rose he sprang to his sleigh to his team gave a whistle and away they all flew like the down of a thistle but i heard him exclaim ere he drove out of sight happy christmas to all and to all a good night end of a visit from st nicholas by clement c moore end of fireside christmas short stories by various